100 Wealth Hacks I Personally Use is a compilation of podcasts written by Andrew M. Reed, J.D. from 2021 to 2022. The economy and world are rapidly changing. However, there will likely be principles that can benefit you mixed throughout these wealth hacks. Make sure to always do your due diligence and remember these wealth hacks aren't financial advice. These are my personal strategies, tips, and hacks that I've used to survive and prosper in both the United States and Canadian economies over the last 40 years. Without further ado, let's get started. Number one, make sure all your purchases are rewarding. Preferably, you want to get cash or crypto and or crypto back when you make a purchase. Wealth Simple, one of my favorites, uh, offers 1% crypto back on purchases by Visa Enabled Debit. Uh, TD Bank and CIBC and many more have moderately generous reward programs for their credit cards. I personally often use my PC Optimum card for large purchases. And then I pay it back within the month, of course, to avoid the interest fees. And I use those reward points to buy groceries and health supplies. This is the best way to buy. Get paid for buying things. Number two, pay all your credit card balances off every month to avoid interest. Uh, unless you have a better option available. Uh, so one better option I like for those times where I've accumulated debt and it happens to everybody is to refinance that debt at a low rate. So you can do that with a balance transfer offer where they're saying, you know, 0% in, until July if you transfer this balance. Great. Take it. Get that out of that interest, right? And then make your payments over the minimum and in time to meet their deadline. Uh, you know, so if it's no interest until July, then make sure you're budgeting enough to pay until July, but not every possible penny. So if you have more money than that budget, you can use it to invest and get a higher return than that, uh, well, that 0% interest or even a low 4% interest or whatever it might be, right? So if you're investing and getting 8% returns or more, then you can split that money pay off the pay off the debt within the time and also use some of that money to invest so um you hear from a lot of financial gurus out there that say oh just pay off that debt immediately make it the highest priority that's not necessarily the smartest way to go about it i have some um, previous podcasts on managing and getting rid of debt so please check those out if you're in that situation and you need those kind of um that kind of detailed explanation and, and tips that I've personally used. Um, so you can uh, divert money to investments that pay more than the interest rates than you're paying on the credit. Now, some might be wondering why even use credit? Okay, good question. So aside from typically greater rewards than you get from a debit card, um, you increase your power to do things like buying assets, real estate assets, for example. Um, and you're also getting an interest-free short-term loan if you pay it back that same month, right? So if you're paying it back on time within that month for those uh, 28 to 31 days, you're literally spending someone else's money. Well, your money is safely invested working to make you more money. Now, good tip there, though, just only buy things you would have bought anyways per your budget, budget, right? So don't spend more than you would with your debit card using your credit card just because it's available to spend. Number three, economic partner. So this is a person you partner with in a relationship where your combined income or other assets help reduce your expenses, thereby increasing the investing dollars available in your budget. Um, be careful here for obvious reasons. Uh, partners that do not boost your economic prosperity are likely detracting from it. Uh, this may be the biggest personal mistake I've made of the first 39 
years of my life, you know, here or there uh, for most of those times. So be careful, right? Make sure when you're choosing a partner and you're you're sharing um, economic status and that um, that they're boosting, that you're boosting them, they're boosting you, um, that you're prospering together. It's so important and such a common mistake. Number four, where possible, walk or bicycle. Uh, this, you know, finding opportunities to do this instead of driving might allow you to reduce your car insurance cost and to receive low annual mileage discounts on your insurance. Um, two things that I am now getting, and I love these things. Um, I'm basically my car is classified as pleasure status because I'm, you know, I'm walking the mile to work. I'm even using an umbrella in the rain. I'm a very frugal person, as you may tell from the fact that I'm giving you 100 wealth hacks that I personally use. But that being said, it's not always possible. But do it where you can, right? If there's a grocery store within walking distance, then go there frequently with a reusable bag and and get enough groceries that you can actually carry home, even if you have to take three trips to the grocery store instead of one by car. Um you know, and even doing so is going to reduce the amount you spend on groceries, but that's a whole nother benefit. Otherwise, this is going to reduce your car maintenance, your car operation costs, you know, in other words, gas cost, and it's going to reduce your risk of injury or loss from accidents, right? The more you're out there in your car, um, the sooner and more likely it is that somebody's going to drive into you or or something's going to happen where your car gets damaged, you have so much hassle and things to deal with, you can reduce this by reducing your driving. Um, And also walking or or cycling to to whatever place it might be is going to boost your health. And boosting your health is a huge cost saver in itself. Number five, drink water at restaurants and only drink water. Okay, I know that sounds excessively frugal, but hear me out here. Uh, You're splurging on a restaurant trip, and hey, maybe you deserve that restaurant trip. I'd reduce those too if I were you. But water is a good health choice. Uh, See tip number four. And it is a great money saver. You can cut your bill by at least $4 per person per restaurant trip, which can definitely add up to big numbers over time drink water at restaurants. Love it. Number six. This one's a harsh one, but get the least amount of pets you can get by with to sustain your mental health. So I originally had this one at getting no pets, right? But my friend pointed out that this can be a very important part of sustaining mental health, and I get that. So I've changed it to get the least amount of pets you can get by with. Okay. Ideally, you wouldn't have any pets until you're independently wealthy. That's the point where your work is optional to cover your budget. I get that that's unrealistic. Okay. Pets can motivate you to exercise. It can provide physical contact and love. These are priceless things. However, if you can get this from one cat, then do not get two cats. The same applies to dogs or fish or birds, right? If, if your pet seems bored and lonely, then optimize your time with it, okay? If you have a dog, then, um, you know, when you get home, take your dog out to dog park so it's socializing, run with it, play with it, spend that kind of time with it where when you get home, that dog just is going to sleep for until the next, you know, amazing trip that you take it on, right? Um, With cats, leave cat TV. They make these 12-hour cat TV channels that you can use for your cat, right? Um. Try not to get a pet as a companion for your existing pet unless, you know, your vet recommends it or some other truly valid reason, right? Minimize your pets because you have vet bills, pet food, adoption fees, and missed opportunities. For example, I can't go to the networking event, friend. I have to walk Rover. Um, As a person who's owned many pets, I've been there, right? Everybody's been there. You, you miss opportunities from having that pet. Use that pet money you save to invest. And then you can push yourself to that independence that much quicker. And once you're independent, you can have multiple pets if that's what suits you, right? 
you may have to get a part-time job to pay for all the additional pet expenses, but if that's what works for you, at least you're ultimately independent in making that choice. Number seven, call your cell phone provider, your cable internet provider, and tell them about the offer that you just received from a competitor and that you're considering it. And to be honest, actually consider it, right? Weigh the hassle in your mind of changing these providers versus uh, the savings you'll get, okay? And then when you talk to your existing provider, backed by the conviction and righteousness of a well-thought-out and honest truthfulness and well-researched analysis of the cost and benefits, once you've talked to them, right, and try to hash out a deal, let them know that you're considering the competitor, honestly considering the competitor, and they will offer you something. More likely than not, they're going to come out with some kind of deal, right? And work with them on that. Listen to them, hear them out, and then let them know you were hoping for better, Um, right? So they come out with a deal and you're, you're going to save on your existing service and you don't have to make any changes. This is wonderful. Then you tell them you're just hoping for a little bit better. Like, what else What else can you do? Because I'm still not fully convinced. Because they usually have a little bit on reserve. Something else they can give you. Another $5, $10 off. Maybe an extra service that you weren't getting before. Um, so with that little, uh, that little bit of wording, right? That you were hoping for a, a little bit better. Just you can get every little piece of the save department pie. Save department being one of the names that they use for the type of specialists that talk to you when you say you're considering a competitor. So these monthly bill savings taste good indeed to go with the, um, the pie reference there. So be sure to deploy the strategy periodically so that you're always getting the best possible deal, right? So if they lock you in for a year because of this, and but you're saving you know, 50%, that's wonderful, but you need to call them back um, after that year in the month that that year ends and just same exact spiel. Uh, let them know that you've received an officer offer from a competitor, even if you had to research and find that offer and that you're considering it. Number eight, some grocery stores cycle their sales so that half of the common ingredients are on sale while the other aren't. And I know this being a former grocery store manager at a very big one. Um, the purpose is obvious to maximize margin by having you buy some of the things that you need at the full price, right? Something that's not on sale. Because if you need, say, pasta and sauce, then they're usually going to have one of those two on sale so that you're buying one of those at full price. So by planning ahead and doing a little bit of stockpiling of the common long-lasting foods, you can make sure to only buy the items that are on sale each week, right? So this week, the sauce is on sale, get two of them, right? Next week, the pasta is on sale, then you get two of those. And you're going to equal out to the amount that you wanted, and every last thing you bought was on sale. And this is going to add up to considerable savings. Number nine, diversify and increase your revenue streams. Now, I have entire podcasts on this subject, but it is worth mentioning as part of these 100 Wealth Hacks make extra money outside of what you're expecting in your budget and use that money to invest or to pay down high interest debt if need be. I get it, right? There's no judgment here. This can be, so this uh, increased revenue streams, these active streams like uh, podcasting, for example, is there something you're interested in there? Just talk about it. You can even record it with a friend. This stuff is easy to do. If If you're interested in that kind of thing, listen to the end of the podcast. I'm actually sponsored by Spotify, and I talk about it at the end of every podcast. So this is something you can do too. And you can get paid, you know, it's not a huge amount, but it's a little bit, and every little bit counts, right? Uh, You can also answer questions on Quora or Quora.com, or you can write the questions. I do both, and I still get a a very small passive income stream for both those. Um, You could have a YouTube channel. Um, I have one, but they're not paying me yet. Okay, fair enough. Those things take time to build. YouTube channels, you have to have lots of people watching. They take time to build. It's difficult. You have to put some effort into that particular uh, active revenue stream. 
You can answer surveys, mystery shopping, you name it. There's so many possible active streams out there. Get a small part-time job. Um, are you decent at English? You could teach English as a second language and do a couple hours per week for that. Um, and yeah, it just gives you a little bit of icing on top of your income. These are considered active streams. You can also boost passive streams like owning dividend paying stocks. I love all these. I love all the streams. I can't tell you how much. Um, so don't limit yourself. Most wealthy people have tons of revenue streams. It just makes sense. Number 10, where possible by used. So when you're independently wealthy, you can consider that fancy brand new dish that you've always been craving, you know, that luxury car, that brand new, beautiful guitar, all these things you want, that handmade brand new rug, whatever you're into, right? But for now, and while you're building that wealth, for a tiny fraction of those brand new item costs, you can acquire functional kitchenware, household goods, appliances, even bedding, clothing, books, other entertainment, right? I personally feel that you can buy higher quality used stuff for less than lower quality new stuff if you shop carefully and wisely. Pro tip, always inspect used items very carefully for damage, very, very carefully. Um, cosmetic damage may be irrelevant to purpose, right? So don't skip that high-end used luggage set, whatever it is, because it has a stain on the bottom. Who cares? Who's looking at the bottom of your luggage anyways, right? Fun fact, as soon as you bring home that new item that you purchased, that you know, beautiful rug, and you unpack it and you put it on the floor, it is now a used item. You now own a used item. So you just taken the value loss right there that you could have avoided. That's That's food for thought. Number 11, use things less. Okay, okay, but hear me out here. Use liquid laundry detergent, but use a smaller amount per load. Still works just as well. Saves you big time in the long run. That's one example. Consult your certified laundry doctor before attempting. Toothpaste, use the minimal amount to be effective. Cleaners like spray cleaners, same concept. The least amount of cleaner needed to be effective. Food items like mustard, keep the jar out. Replenish as needed in your plate, right? Rather than pouring out too much originally and then wasting it. Toilet paper and paper towels, hate to say it, but less use is more money. Driving, drive slowly, accelerate more slowly, Yes, you guessed it, less gas, more money. Shampoo and liquid soap, same thing. This stuff is concentrated. You might not need as much as you think you do. If you're paying for heat and water, use the minimal amount of that as well throughout your day, right? Uh, save a few minutes by, or shave a few minutes off of showers, wear sweaters and blankets, Stay more active to reduce the need for expensive heat. Every penny you save turns into dollars off your budget, right? Which in turn leads to assets that can pay you. And what, what can you do there? Well, the cheapest dividend paying stock that I trust and know about is on the Toronto Stock Exchange, TSX DIV, like div. Uh, so, this is a, a group of um, intellectual property uh, purchases, right? So it's a company that holds intellectual property that they get paid residuals on. You own them. You also get paid some of these residuals. So this stock is $3.30 right now, which is up from $2.41 where I bought it at in mid-2021. And it pays about one penny per share monthly. So say that you're saving... $30.30 per month from using these kind of tips, right? That's uh, 10 of those div shares per month. That's 10 cents a month. In 10 months, you have enough div to pay you $1 every month, meaning that you get a free div share every three months, reinvesting the dividends. 
in 32 months, and I mapped this all out, you'll have gained uh, $131 over the cash value just from um, just from those dividends being reinvested. So you'll have uh, $1,102.20 versus $959.60, assuming it holds the price. And you'd be earning one free div share every month. That's at $3.30 um, every single month. That's just from saving you know, $30.30 per month. And this uh, illustrates how powerful each of these wealth hacks can be over time, especially using them in combination, you will be an unstoppable force. Number 12, logistical efficiency at home. This is where if you have errands, chores, tasks, you map them out in advance and find the optimal pathway to completion before you start. This will increase your available time and can reduce the amount spent per errand. For example, if today you need groceries, post office, uh, and have a doctor's appointment, then plan around the immovable, right? Which is going to be the doc doctor's appointment. Go to the post office first, get that done and over with, um, and get groceries on the way back to minimize the temperature fluctuations. Now, if the location affects the optimal sequence, right, the cheapest pathway to get there to save the most money, then just modify your plan, right? If, uh, if you need to go to the doctor's appointment last or first because of location and how that route could save you gas, then do what you need to do. The point is maximize your precious time. Number 13, strive to own at least one Bitcoin. At least hey, you'll be rare. There's only 21 million Bitcoin. It is overwhelmingly likely the price of Bitcoin will continue to skyrocket in value because of this very fact of its scarcity. New Bitcoin, uh, the 3 million that are still unmined, are getting harder and harder to mine by design. So continue buying small fractions of Bitcoin, regardless of price, until you hit that one Bitcoin minimum at least. This is what the Bitcoiners uh, call stacking sats. Sat is short, for, is short for Satoshi, which is the technical name of the smallest unit of account in Bitcoin. It equals to 0 0.00000001 Bitcoin. For perspective, one Satoshi will be $1 when one Bitcoin is worth $100 million USD. Number 14, you can have as many bank accounts as you want. Different accounts for different things. So I, for example, have five accounts with Wellsimple, three with Coast Capital, three with TD Bank, and one with Tangerine. And for all of these, I pay a total of $3.95 per month. And all of that goes to the TD minimum use checking account. And that account is on the chopping block, being considered as no longer needed, thanks to, thanks to the versatility of the Tangerine and the Wellsimple cash checking accounts I have. So you can use multiple bank accounts uh, to simplify accounting, right? Like one income stream per account for easier bookkeeping purposes, right? You can uh, take advantage of the benefits of the different separate accounts by having more than one, right? Like Tangerine has a slight interest rate on checking. So if I'm paying a bill in 10 days, then I can hold the money in there and at least it will get a little bit of interest um, rather than not making me any money at all. And TD has a US funds account, so I can take and hold US currency without paying an exchange fee. And I can wait for the optimal time to convert it based on how weak or strong the Canadian dollar is so that I can just maximize how much uh, that conversion is gonna do for me. And Coast Capital, that checking account has unlimited transactions at no cost at all, which is great for just uh, all the little things uh, TD and Tangerine can connect easily with the CRA, which is very convenient for logging in and for verifying information. Um, the Wealth Simple Cash account offers 1% cash back when you spend. It goes back into your crypto account. At least I've set mine to do that. And they have a Visa debit card that goes with their uh, account. And it's kind of a side benefit, but it's probably the best looking 
debit card that I've ever seen, by the way. It looks like a high-end credit card, jet black with a W, and it rewards you like one too. So avoid as many fees as you can when you're adding these bank accounts, right? Um, zero is the optimal number. That should be your goal. Take advantage of bonuses to sign up opportunities, right? Sometimes these banks will offer $250, $300, if you just set them up with some kind of automatic deposit, well, that's fine, right? Set your electricity bill your um, to just be taken out of there or, you know, have your payroll go into it. Uh, it's worth it for that $250, $300 extra. Um, just uh, make sure you're not signing up to pay monthly or annual fees to have the account because that would just eliminate the benefit. Um Fees, monthly annual fees for accounts, unless you're high volume and unless you're getting exceptional rewards is, in my opinion, obsolete extortion and you can do better. Number 15, help your causes and other things that you care about with time and not necessarily money. If you're in the part of your life where you're building wealth to be independent, this is not the time to give financial donations, uh, regardless of the intensity of the need, right? So look at it as a matter of perspective, right? I mean, you have what, less than $100,000 probably if you're uh, listening to this podcast and listening to these wealth hacks, yeah, not to overgeneralize, but um, you know, you may be listening just because you're a, a friend or family member of mine that has uh, considerably more, either way. Look at it uh, through perspective. Think of how many buildings there are in your city, right? Each worth at least a half million dollars conservatively. All the separate single family homes. I mean, it's almost too many to count. And each of those is worth half a million dollars. There's so much money already out there. And so with this giant pool of money, money is going to flow to the causes um, that you care about, right? So it's going to flow even if you contribute your last $10 or not, your $10 is probably not going to make any difference. And I'm sorry to say that. Um, it just, it's unlikely, right? And it's difficult because these causes are so important, but try to restrain yourself from donating money and instead volunteer your time. Local charities need your help. There are plenty of places to volunteer. If you don't have a cause you're passionate about and don't know where to go, then you can just Google volunteer in my city and you'll see um and even four hours on a weekend can make a huge difference um we'll do so much more than a ten dollar twenty dollar contribution and one day if you're taking that money that you would have given and you're diverting it to assets then you will be able to help more than you could have if you were contributing ten or twenty dollars where you're still in uh, financial slavery so if you're you know, in the end, you'll be contributing hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars at a time because you took the time to build that independent wealth. Um, and to clarify financial slavery, right? This is what I mean by having no choice but to work a job to pay your bills, right? Like you are not going to be able to make your rent if you don't work. And if you lost your job, you'd have to go get another job right away. This is financial slavery, um, in my opinion. Now, and this is what we're, we're doing here, right? Why we're applying these wealth hacks, why we're living frugally, why we are carefully saving and investing our money is to have the opposite of that financial slavery, to have the choice, right? Now, I will most likely work till the very end, but it's just having that choice that is everything. One note, you may be able to creatively find ways to use your money within your tight budget to still help the charity. Okay. For example, if the charity is running a store that is selling secondhand goods and you absolutely need to get something, well, that's the place to buy it from, right? Don't buy it from some corporate store when you can benefit the charity at the same time with your money. Uh, or another example, if the charity is selling gift baskets and you're in need for of a gift, you know, birthday or Christmas gift or whatever, well, make your money count twice, right? Buy from that charity. Um, and that just makes your money twice as effective and you're still helping a great cause. So there are definitely uh, smart and creative exceptions that you can do to help the world even more.
Number 16. Use a toaster oven for reheating and baking smaller things. It typically uses less electricity than the big oven, and it may even give you more control over the crispiness due to the ease of inspection of the food that you are cooking. Number 17 from The Wealthy Barber. Pay yourself first. Be so lucky as to receive an unexpected windfall of cash. For example, an insurance refund of $115. Pay yourself first when you get that money, right? This is not extra money to waste. Rather, these windfalls can provide a much needed boost for a beginner's investment account. You know, so if you get $115, invest $100, and then you can tuck that $15 away toward a little something for your own pleasure, right? Um, maybe to save up to go out for a nice meal or whatever you're into. Uh, in the meantime, let's do 15 push-ups right now. Really earn that $15, right? Um, it makes whatever you buy with it that much sweeter. I don't even don't even like free money. Um, so you can you can earn it. Just do 15 push-ups. You'll still get that that reward feeling. Um, and then take that hundred dollars that you set aside for investing and add it right away to your TFSA. You know, assuming you still have contribution room. And then pick a nice stock or an ETF to grow your wealth. Maybe even get some dividends just for owning it. It just makes sense. Number 18. Avoid commission fees when you're in the beginner stages of investing. I know that for advanced investors, the commission fees are usually associated with supreme features like complex charting abilities and options buying abilities, such as those provided by Quest Trade, which charges five bucks a trade or, or something like that. But until you're advanced, don't pay commission fees for investing into your own future. The mere thought makes me shudder as I was once paying nearly $10 per trade to TD Bank and I have lost hundreds of dollars in doing so back in the day. Um, that is, until I realized the advantage of having a wealth simple trade account with zero fees. Uh, the charting capabilities are incredibly limited with the wealth simple trade account, right? You can you can look at different time charts, and that's about it. You know, you can see it on the one year, the five year, the the one month, the day, but you don't even get real time numbers, right? The numbers every update every 15 minutes and unless you upgrade and pay a monthly fee. But this is okay, right? This is all right for the long-term investors. It's not great for day traders. And there's workarounds. Um, with this, I personally use Google Finance and I still have access to my TD RRSP account so I can get real-time charting if I need it um, since they ignored my close request. But it seems to be a policy where TD can't continue to rob you with fees if your balance is zero. Huh, should that change, I'll eliminate the TD RRSP account. I'll tell you what. But um, one other thing about Wealth Simple, it will tell you the expected all in cost in real time at the moment before you execute the trade, right? So you'll be able to see what you're pretty much going to pay as much as it can estimate because things change quickly, right? But again, not the best option for day traders, but for long term investors doing the occasional rebalancing. Throw away the fees. There is a link to Wealth Simple Trade in this podcast description. And should you choose to use it, we will both get some free money in our accounts if you use that link. And a big thanks to all of you who, who have done so already. Number 19, make the effort to get the refund. Now, this might just be for people like me, but I hate using my time and energy, et cetera, to stand in line or to wait on hold for hours to get the refund. But you know what? It can and it should be done. You can multitask the phone calls. You can clean and tidy your house where you're waiting, a full laundry or something, um, letting your focused righteousness build into laser beams that will reveal the optimal outcome of the conversation, right? Uh, Basically, just let it build. Now, I'm not saying be mean to these reps. Not at all. Absolutely not, right? Um, be diplomatic. Be focused. Know what you want to get out of it and go for it. Be ready to push back through some pushback. And um, so once you get to the front of the line or if or the end of that two-hour 
waiting on hold, right? Tell them if it's actually true, how this hassle has affected you. You know, you've taken two hours out of my day so I can get this $20 refund. And I could have been doing other things. I could have spent time with my family. I could have been making more money, right? And if, if you share this with them, you may find yourself the recipient of extra rewards points or other benefits that are set aside to appease people in your situation. Um, because it's still cheaper to these companies than losing a customer forever, which was a choice that you could have made. Instead, you chose to take your time and make things right. So get what you're entitled to, and it will feel great later to see that refund applied. Number 20, check the back aisles of grocery stores and of drugstores. Okay, so in these back end caps, you can often find a clearance shelf where items that are near expiration or that are discontinued, even pending rebrands, right? They're just changing the design of the logo and then they have to pull them from the shelves. Now they're up there for substantial discounts because typically um, they'll get disposed of and then the store will get a credit. But even while they're disposed of, they have the right to, to liquidate them and generate a little extra money on them and they will often do so. Uh, so if it's something you use frequently, load up now, right? Even if it will exceed your budget because in the long run, your average spend will be lower. Um, something to consider there, right? Um, averages are important. So budgets are really great, but don't be afraid to zoom out a little bit and seize an opportunity if it will save you money in the long run, because that is the actual game that we are playing here is the long game. Bonus tip, don't use the items that you just purchased um, and you have a have some extra ones, don't use them in excess of normal usage just because you have a big supply, right? Just use them normally, uh, resist the temptation. Number 21, max sold online auctions. Okay, you can, you can Google this, uh, find out what it is, max sold online auctions. So watching these can yield incredible deals on gifts and other things that you might want. In these auctions, you will bid on items, and if you win, you'll pick them up on the pickup day at the designated time. Now, I'm not advocating wasting money here, but some entertainment, rewards, shopping are necessary to many to help them enjoy life and prosper. I'm frugal, but I work hard, and if I want to spend 10 to $30 per se out of my spending budget on the rare occasion, so be it. Uh, nope, this may force me to sacrifice something else, like a pizza night or something. And that's just the way it goes. I'm okay with that, right? Um, max sold online auctions are a fun and exciting way to bid responsibly, possibly competing at the same time, which can be fun for some. And sometimes uh, your bids will support local charities, or always, in my personal case. Number 22, protect your identity, protect your credit. Let me tell you now, Canada is one of the worst so-called first world countries in terms of protecting its citizens from credit and identity fraud. There is no way in Canada to freeze your credit to prevent inquiries and new credit lines. In the US, this is a simple matter. In Canada, not so much. And the punishment in Canada for identity fraud is a mere $5,000 fine with an optional two year less a day in jail. And I will tell you as someone with a four year degree in criminology that uh, due to the low risk of getting caught and the relatively mild punishment, uh, identity thieves are unlikely to be deterred. Now, most provinces, including BC, don't even have mandatory fraud alert where the banks and the companies will at least call you to see if you authorize the inquiry, right? So you can request this from the credit bureau and then the provinces tell the banks and companies they don't need to actually listen to that request. Um, but you can set this up for free for a year with evidence of fraud via Experian and TransUnion, the two Canadian credit bureaus separately. 
But since most provinces don't require the banks and companies to actually obey, well, kind of useless. So then what? I'll tell you what I do. It's the only possible way that I see to even have a chance here. Vigilance. So I will use the free creditkarma.ca monitoring system. Creditkarma with a K dot CA monitoring system. Now karma has the K, not credit. Uh, the app will alert me when anyone files an inquiry with TransUnion. So I get the alert right away at least, right? Then uh, to dispute this, you have to go through the tedious process of contacting TransUnion Canada and going through their forms to authenticate you. And then you have to go and do the same thing with Equifax Canada, which is a little bit easier with Equifax. Um, so say they've applied to a Scotia bank and they managed to get an account in your name because of the lack of verification that Scotia bank does allegedly, uh, then you will also likely have to visit that bank or company that the false inquiry was filed at in person. This effort is exhausting and horrible and my deepest sympathies to those attacked. Remember though, you must make these efforts. You must do whatever it takes to protect yourself. You must go to the bank and deal with all this. Um, so one suggestion, one tip, try to vote for politicians that don't need an assistant to turn on their computer. John Horgan. Uh, also, politicians from planet Earth are encouraged. Cough, Trudeau. <laughs> okay. Number 23. Learn to do things on your own. One new thing a month, perhaps. Good timeline. It's good for your brain and for your soul, but also you can save money. Examples. Anyone can learn to replace the air filter in their gas car. And in many cars, you can do your own wipers, lights, even spark plugs. Ooh. Haircuts, sewing repairs, small household repairs, computer and technology things. Much of that is easily learnable. There are many people with the same issues out there that have already found solutions and have posted those solutions for all to benefit from. Uh, word of caution, weigh your risks first. Uh, replacing a screen on a laptop, for example, it could be a tough job. If you can't risk losing the computer, then take it to a professional where you will have better chances of success and their work will hopefully be warranted, right? Always assess your risks. Number 24, learn the laws that apply to you. So you run a hot dog stand, know the applicable laws, so you can always measure your risks accurately. Applying the law to fact patterns, that is the traditional realm of lawyers, maybe paralegals too, but you still can and should empower yourself by learning the laws of your business, your area, your neighborhood, the road, the properties you own or plan to own. Your mind is theoretically infinite in its capacity to store knowledge, so you might as well use it. And one final tip, uh, collect and organize these legal and other resources either on the computer or by paper, because your mind might trigger the memory reference, and then it's ideal and important to go back and review the law itself carefully to make sure that your memory and limited use of that law and application is accurate. Rem reminder, that's uh, not advice. Always consult a lawyer if you need application of a law to a fact pattern. Wink. Number 25, contacts equal contracts. This may be the most important hack out of these 100 wealth hacks. And sadly, it might be the most likely to be dismissed. So this saying came to me via Grant Cardone. Whether you love him or hate him, you can watch him crush poverty on the show Undercover Billionaire, where he was given $100, an empty burner phone, and an old truck. And he made a business in 90 days that was appraised at $5.6 million. Um, and he did a lot of that by networking, going out there, making contacts, right? Contacts equals contracts. Networking, a lost art that has become even more difficult during COVID times. But it is so essential to every career, to every business, to wealth itself. You must 
build contacts of all types. Uh, be a resource to those contacts, and they will be a resource to you. All the education in the world is absolutely useless without the right contacts. I will dedicate yet another podcast specifically to networking techniques, but here's a tip. If you're an introvert like myself or even remotely shy, do something to create an opening for extroverts to start a conversation with you. Something colorful, perhaps, or a shirt that merits comment. Something flashy that can start a conversation. You would be surprised how effective this technique can be. For example, I have a t-shirt that says, I accept Bitcoin, that my dear friend bought for me. It's got a big Bitcoin symbol on it. So people have literally shouted from 100 meters away in support of Bitcoin. Uh, why not? Okay. Just create an opening. Be creative. Number 26, protect your data, protect your credit cards. Many of you may be calling me Captain Obvious right now, but, but listen here. Uh, too many people are doing this wrong. And as someone considered very knowledgeable about cybersecurity, I can provide a few potentially illuminating tips. Tip number one, having to get a new credit card number because of fraud can be recorded on your credit report as closing and opening a new account, right? Um, so this can be devastating to your credit score, especially if you're in the middle of rebuilding it, right? So to find out for sure, you can ask your credit card issuer whether the new card will appear as a new trade line on your credit report and whether your credit history will list the account's age as that of the new card or the old one. Um, however, until you know it won't, then that risk is very valid, right? This is a risk that you can uh, take steps to avoid because you don't want to damage your credit score by having to replace your credit card because some hacker has gotten the number. So take all possible precautions, uh, such as the one in this tip number two, longer passwords are harder to crack. So use a variety of symbols, some capital letters, some numbers, and do not use words of any kind in there. Use a variety of passwords by adding the first letter of the, uh, the place in the end, right? So here's an example. So your password is, you know, lowercase d, capital Z, 139, question mark, semicolon, dollar sign. Then you would add this uh, lowercase w at the end for your well simple password, or a lowercase t at the end for your tangerine password. So you can memorize that first part and you know, okay, I'm logging into Bank of America, I need a low, lowercase b, you know, I'm logging into TD, I need a lowercase td um, at the end, right? That way, uh, so some IT people might suggest even more caution, right? And they'll want you to have a totally individual and unique password for everything. And I get that. And there might be situations that warrant that. But if you end up writing your passwords on paper, that adds up to another risk that you have just added. I don't care if it's in a safe or hidden in a pile of papers on your desk or in an empty book safe or something like that. It doesn't matter, right? Somebody could get a hold of that paper and have all of your passwords at once. And this happens more often than your actual password getting hacked. So if you can have one core password memorized and then a system to add variety, then you can avoid the risk of a password paper being seen, lost, or stolen. Uh, mm -hmm. Tip three, set up two-factor authentication for the important stuff, email, banks, Google, Apple, and Microsoft accounts, for starters. Um, anything where you have personal data, and that includes everything that requires your birthday or more to sign up. Tip number four here, monitor your cards, monitor your credit, use that credit karma. It goes with the previous well pack. Tip five, use a card theft proof wallet. So these theft tools be, have become cheaper, more commonplace, but um, so it's easier for people to get your numbers and the protection has become cheaper too. So it's 20 or $30 for an anti-theft wallet. It's just basically a strip of metal that keeps them from scanning your card number from your, from your cards chip. So it is, it is worth the money to get that kind of wallet for cards that you're carrying outside of the house. Number 27, pay less taxes. Yes. Yes. Workers 
pay the most taxes. As much of the money that they make is taxed, then much of the money that they spend is taxed, and then everything in between is also taxed, right? And the wealthy pay the least amount of taxes in comparison, right? So they save money on what they spend. They use that to offset what they make, and they end up paying very little taxes, especially relative to the amount of money that they have. So to preserve your wealth, you must head in the direction of paying less taxes and less tax filing expenses. So although how you do this will be mostly unique to you, here are a few general tips, right? So claim your deductions, right? Like mileage and networking costs, right? You can deduct that restaurant bill from a networking event. So save your receipts for that, right? Pay money into your RRSP, right? Your, um, your registered retirement savings plan account. This will generate a tax deduction. Um, and uh, hold your capital gains in your RRSP and your TFSA accounts, right? So you're making money off stocks, they're growing, you're getting dividends and stuff. If you can, keep those in your tax-free accounts so that you're not being charged for those capital gains even when you sell the stocks. Okay, um, limit the rebalancing of long-term investment accounts to minimize realized capital gains, right? So say you have so much money that you're opening up a personal investment account. That's congratulations, by the way. You've maxed out your RRSP, you've maxed out your TFSA, and you have a personal one. Okay, but in that one, that's where you keep your super long-term stuff. Because right now, it's not a capital gain unless you sell it as a gain. So if you just have some Tesla in there that just keeps going up over 10 years and it's boosting your net worth, fantastic, right? Leave it there. Don't sell it. Don't realize that capital gain. And very importantly, strict bookkeeping, receipt keeping. So you and your accountant can calculate accurately and be subsequently prepared for audit defense if necessary. But above all, if you want lower taxes, vote for the politicians most likely to actually lower them. In other words, in Canada, don't vote NDP, Liberal, or Green. It's sad because they all have wonderful dreams and beautiful goals that you know my heart might agree with, but they will pay for the mismanagement of those dreams and goals with your money. No way, no way. Conservatives and libertarians claim they will reduce and eliminate taxes, but do your due diligence on the individual politician and make your vote count. Beware of tax cuts for the uber-rich at the expense of beginning and intermediate investors. You see that quite a lot from these conservatives. Unacceptable. Once you vote them in, hold them accountable. It's your civic duty. Number 28. Waste less time. Rest is important. I get that. But lying on the couch in damaging positions, playing on your phone, that is not quality rest. That is literally harmful. Reduce pointless phone minutes surfing, right? At least be learning something, even if you can't move because you're so physically exhausted, as I often am at the end of my day job every day, uh, which is a feeling I love. But learn something, right? Learn another language. Learn about stocks and investing, about history. There's so much out there. You know, fill your brain. Fill your brain with it, even, even if it's an idle learning process, right? Um, like watching a history documentary. So if you can move, Tidy up, stay clean, knock some items off the to-do list, and especially stretch and do yoga every single day. This might seem obvious to all, but are you truly using your time as efficiently as possible? It is all connected, our bodies, our minds, our health, and our subsequent prosperity. Number 29, indulge less frequently. Another patently obvious hack, but one often ignored um, and it's one that I'm occasionally still working on myself. If you're a foodie, for example, and you go out twice a week, cut it down to once a week, right? If it's once a week, do it every two weeks. If you like to have a nice Sunday drive, every second Sunday, go for it. Uh, the money you save here will help you build the life that will allow you near unlimited indulgence. If, of course, at that point, you can break these good habits that you have instilled in yourself. I mean, when you have all the money, 
that you need to live independently and not be caught in financial slavery, then go ahead and enjoy it, right? That's the time for that. Wealth hack number 30. Take advantage of free food, snacks, refreshments, etc. at work and events, right? This is pretty much the only way I ate at law school. I'm sure we all have those stories, right? There was zero leftover money for food after other living expenses and trying to pay for six, $700 textbooks. Um, and although I was often earning money on the side, which was harmful for my academic career, but necessary, um, I got involved as much as I could with anything I could get involved with uh, that I cared about. Student government, honor court, I was in everything. And generally, if there is a meeting with food, you know, say at your current job or something like that, don't hold back. Eat until you're full. Um, store it in your gut like a chipmunk storing nuts in their cheek. Okay, you know, considering your diet and everything like that. But seriously, eat. Take advantage of it. Uh, if that's the, the right choice for you, right? Because obviously, if you have an unlimited supply of free food, restrain yourself. I've been there once. I had a roommate that worked at a pizza place and would bring home nine to 10 pizzas every night. And it was um, less is more when it comes to pizza, right? So restrain yourself if that's the case, if you have unlimited supply like I did back then. But if you have a sporadic supply, right, you're only getting you know, um, a meeting every week or two that just happens to be catered, get yours, eat, right? Eat a variety of food. Even if you don't like the way it tastes, right? Get a couple uh, exotic things, some vegetables, you know, get that diet variety um, as long as it's healthy for you. Uh, that food will often be disposed of if you don't eat it. So you can also add the benefit of helping the environment to save more money 31. for investing. Affirmations reprogramming the mind okay these are especially useful if you are deeply programmed into a poverty mindset as i personally used to be so i listen to prosperity affirmations for at least a few hours every day often all night and then into the morning um, the people who make these affirmations that i listen to say 21 days minimum um, and I've been doing these affirmations since a few weeks before my very first investments, not too long ago, relatively. I've often done affirmations in my life, but this is the <clears throat> first time that I've done them for money and personal finance and investments. I generally will play them while I sleep, while I walk, and through the morning, um, or you know, if I'm working remotely or doing chores, I'll just play them in the background, and I will actively repeat them in my head, occasionally say them out loud. Um, you must actively embrace them for maximum effectiveness. And this gets, um, this gets easier over time. It gets more, more ingrained, right? When you first start doing it, you might even find your mind and body resisting it and saying, no, this isn't me. I'm not meant to be wealthy and prosperous. And you'll literally, you'll feel that uh, pushback, um, or at least I did. Uh, but over time, you know, it's smoothed out, it becomes part of your actual programming. So you can find affirmations on YouTube, you could um, just search for prosperity affirmations, and they're completely free. It's hard to go wrong here. Any kind of prosperity affirmations are going to be pretty good. Um, one tip, uh, gratitude affirmations go hand in hand with with the regular I am affirmations. Gratitude itself is key. Um, gratitude will attract opportunity and prosperity. It's a beautiful cycle. Remember that the subconscious mind doesn't recognize past or future statements. So you can't say, I will be prosperous, or it just your subconscious mind is present focused. It, doesn't understand negative statements either. You can't say, I will eliminate my toxic debt, right? Better to say, I am debt-free and gaining positive net worth. Um, you can write and repeat your own affirmations custom to you, and you can use those on their own or in conjunction with the, with the YouTube or other affirmations that you find. 
Number 32, manage and protect your social media. Uh, we're talking long-term game here. So no matter where you are in life, this is necessary. Protect yourself now so that you can uh, preserve your social media for future opportunities. Okay, so when you're out there networking, making contacts, searching for employment, they will be checking out your social media, right? You're going for job promotions even, new job interviews, a million reasons why you shouldn't have anything divisive, polarizing, or offensive, etc., on your social media pages whatsoever. So do you know what's showing on your Facebook, Instagram? If the answer is no, this has got to make the top of your to-do list. Go through and delete anything that meets those criteria. You know, whether it's divisive or polarizing or offensive, delete it. It's not doing you any benefit to have that stuff on there, right? Whatever reason you're giving right now for not doing this, like free speech and, well, I'm a person, an individual, it's not worth it, right? Wealth will bring actual freedom. Until then, you are a financial slave. You have to work to pay the bills. Um, so there's no such thing as freedom for you if you're in that state. Unless you consider homelessness freedom. Uh, so go remove some speed bumps from your pathway by auditing your social media to these standards. Here's another tip. Don't trust anybody you haven't met in person and rarely then either, right? Make your passwords difficult. Listen to Wealth, Wealth Hacks 21 through 30 for tips on managing passwords. Protect your social media. Number 33, use gas station point cards. I'm dead serious. I, uh, at the time of writing this, I just got $10 off my full tank at the local Shell gas station because I had earned 95 air miles. Now, don't ask me exactly how the air miles system works, but every month or two, and I drive very infrequently, I seem to get a discount of around $10 from my air miles. So that's $120 a year. Um, I carry a gas station card or an app for the three gas stations that I might go to. Um, so these points add up. I know it's a little bit of a pain, but really you get in the habit of it. You'll flash it every time or you'll run it through the, the gas station pump itself and you will save a considerable amount of money, a considerable amount of money, and all that money adds up, as you know. Wealth hack 34, be nice to solicitors. Give them nothing, but be kind, right? These people are hustlers, and it's a small world. You might want to hire them as employees for your company one day. Tell them honestly as soon as possible that you have nothing to spare at this time, right? They will hopefully understand and appreciate your upfront dealing, while at least acknowledging that they're human and hustlers at two, right? So you're acknowledging that they're a human being just trying to hustle. Um, repeat a second time if you have to, right? I don't have anything to spare right now. I'm really sorry, but I wish you the best, right? Repeat that if you have to. After that, withdraw from the conversation. Your time is valuable. Um, you don't want to pander to them. You just want to treat them with a bit of respect. Uh, this goes for the individual person that may be uh, requesting sponsorship for that next $20 pack of cigarettes. Don't invest your hard-earned money on that, with maybe some exceptions. Okay, me, for example, I'll carry a small emergency change fund while I'm in my car or biking or walking. And if I see a situation involving someone in a vulnerable demographic or situation, I will give them a small amount from that fund. Um, so on that note, the topic is worthy of its own podcast episode one of these days, right? A survival guide for the newly homeless in Canada. So that's going to be in the works when I get through all these 100 wealth hacks. Um, and just basically what I would do to get out of that situation as quickly as possible and to even use it to prosper, right? It's, it's always possible as long as you have the right knowledge and mindset and, and plan, strategic plan, right? To be able to adapt and pivot even in a situation like that. And this topic will be especially relevant with the looming housing crisis caused by our wonderful Canadian government, but I digress too much. 
Number 35, micro certifications, all the rage. Add to your value by getting micro certifications from colleges, nonprofits, wherever you can get one. Uh, for myself, this past year, I've acquired a digital marketing bootcamp certification from Alacrity Canada, which was free with a by applying, and I have four other micro certifications for nonprofit management and fundraising and grant writing from nonprofitready.org, all of these for free. And uh, looking back, I should have worked to get even more, right? Get as many micro certification as you can. They will just look great on your resume and add to your value. Number 36, eat out of the pot and other extreme kitchen related penny pinchers. Okay, these will have to be specific to you and your diet. But for me, yeah, if I'm home alone, and um, I will eat Annie's mac and cheese plus a can of skipjack tuna right out of the pot. It's another extreme pitch, right? It's one less dish that I have to wash and put through the dishwasher, which costs money. So it extends that dishwashing cycle. And when you use the dishwasher or any major appliance, you can watch, if you're tracking your electricity usage, you can watch that day spike, right? So pushing that off for another day and extending that cycle, you can save a little bit, right? And it's all about saving a bit. Another extreme uh, kitchen pinch of mine, uh, this recipe, ramen noodles with lemon pepper spice. I strain it, then add two drips of low sodium soy sauce and I uh, get the ramens for 20 cents at Dollarama. Um, so I can still create an entire filling meal with a reasonable amount of protein and carbs and low, relatively low fat for 40 cents. And this is in Canada in 2022. I can create a meal for 40 cents with that recipe um, that has a reasonable level of nutrition. So find your own that work for you, but have a few extreme kitchen related penny pinchers in your arsenal. Number 37, focus, be self aware. Mistakes are costly. Reduce them by being aware of yourself and your environment, reducing your dangers, minimizing unnecessary risks. If you're doing a task that involves risk, do not add to that risk by multitasking and thereby being distracted. This doesn't mean that all multitasking is bad, by the way. I've heard some spiritual gurus preach this, but I disagree. They say don't multitask. There are some times where it's more efficient to multitask, so go for it. Just stick to risk-calculated multitasking, right? Choose the times that you multitask where you're not risking a costly mistake by doing so. Number 38, and this one hits close to home, don't over haggle your service techs. This might seem counterintuitive. Andrew, I thought you were about saving money. Shouldn't we try to pinch every penny we can with those guys too? Okay, but if you do that, you take away their incentive to do their best job for you, and then you could end up with something less. And when it's a service tech working on something critical to you, that could cost you money down the road through additional repairs or shorter lifespan of whatever the tech is working on. So pay what they ask. You know, you hired them, you should have shopped around first, but you made an agreement. So pay what they ask and even consider tipping them a bit. This could pay off well in the long run because then that tech might be uh, more willing to provide uncontracted support, right? So you might be able to send them a text if something goes wrong in the future. And they're like, okay, the guy gave me a tip. Um, I'm going to respond and just help them out a bit, right? They might even give you a higher priority the next time you need the service, right? So they have two customers um, hoping for the same time slot, right? But you gave them a tip last time and you didn't argue the price. So you could get the service and getting whatever you need fixed sooner, uh, maybe that much more valuable to you, right? So consider it an investment to not over haggle your service techs. Okay, number 39. This one is a bit extreme as well. A couple of these are, but that's okay. Use them if you can. If you really want to save money at the grocery store, 
don't grab a buggy or a basket, all right? Or at least downsize. You're going to go in with a buggy, go in with a basket. Going to go in with a basket, don't have any basket at all. That way, you can only buy what you can fit into that smaller container. So having worked as a grocery store manager, we would strategically place uh, empty baskets um, for your convenience as you walk through the grocery store, right? So you're coming through and then right by that sale, there'd be a basket and you weren't going to buy that thing, but you know, and you can't really carry it with what you have. Oh, but here's a basket. So now you can, right? And now we've increased your basket size and you're paying more money uh, leaving that grocery store. So keep that in mind, right? Um, if you limit yourself to what you came in to buy and even reduce that a little bit, you can save a ton of money. And this is a good time to start saving money at the grocery store. As you know, inflation has made these prices ridiculous. Um, one other tip with that, only bring a single reusable bag, right? Or limit yourself to how many reusable bags you bring. That can help constrict your, your purchase level too. Um, so if you're walking to the grocery store with a single reusable bag, you know, if that's, you know, if that's viable for you, then, um, will cause you to really value what you choose to buy and bring home, right? So then you might even eat a little bit less or portion out a little bit more. And it's sad that we have to do this in this day and age, but such is the cost of inflation, right? If you have a family to feed, this tip won't really work for you. But alternatively, shop in advance so that you won't be pulled in by promotions and end caps and flash sales, things like that. Um, Watch out for electronic versions of those, but those are a little bit easier to resist. So you can do this by using online shopping, right? You don't have to have it delivered and pay that delivery fee. You can pick it up usually. And if you pick it up, you generally won't have a fee. They'll shop for you. You can be very specific. And a lot of people are concerned, oh, what if uh, they pick out the thing I wouldn't like, like with produce? Well, you don't have to pay for it in that case, right? You can just send them a quick email and say, hey, this, you know, these bananas were bruised. What, what were you thinking, guys? Um, and they will uh, usually just credit you that that cost, right? It costs the grocery store almost nothing to uh, to credit you for those kind of things. Uh, just something to consider. It's and you can be specific in your request. So if you really want the best fruit, you can make a note while you're online shopping at most of these stores and say, "Hey, please be careful." Um, I, for one, am very picky about those kind of things, but you put the instructions in there then you're pretty well protected uh final one for this podcast number 40 monitor your paychecks for those of us uh, receiving paychecks independently track your hours and make sure you are getting credited accordingly so i had an employee find an error uh, by tracking his his paychecks and hours right and this went back for six months. And due to an accounting error, um, this tracking that he did led him to recover eight hours of lost pay. So he tracked his hours with a spreadsheet and he noticed the discrepancy over time. Uh, even the most well-meaning employers can potentially short you. So it's just prudent to keep track yourself. Protect yourself at all times. Number 50. Number 41 don't panic. So you wake up to your own blood in the streets. That's a common term for a red day. The latest FUD from the Fed or global events has dampened prices on a macro level. FUD is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And it's one of two emotions that can have an en masse effect on markets as a whole. The other big emotion is FOMO fear of missing out, or in other words, greed. If you are interested in how to navigate through other people's emotions when uh, investing in the stock market and other markets, check out my prior podcast on the subject. So, things are bloody, and you've got your finger on the sell button. It's better to cut your losses before your Hard-earned money goes completely down the drain as the entire stock market boils its way down to zero. I personally say to myself, hold steady there, pal. These storms come and go. On the macro level, 
given enough time, the waters will calm and the skies will be blue. And there will be prophets again for those who stayed strong during the storm. A characteristic known as diamond hands. That's right. Tip. Cut your losses when the fundamentals fail on a micro level. Uh, the company that you had done your due diligence on is getting crushed by a disruptive competitor. They're not even growing. They're even taking losses. Acknowledge this and react. Their stock price has been on a long-term steady decline. Get out of there ASAP, even at a loss. Don't hope against fundamentals that there's that there is some risky gambling. Uh, this don't panic wealth hack can be applied to all storms in life. Apply this wealth hack liberally. Number 42. Take care of your skin, especially the skin on your face. If you start doing this now or boost your current regime, regime you can save yourself from very expensive treatments later on that will be less effective than protecting what you have now guy or girl it's irrelevant uh, your youth what remains of it it is your most precious resource and the one thing that you can buy although more than likely you will be trying to buy it at all cost when it is mostly gone technically appearance is irrelevant but is it studies show that the most attractive people are mo more likely to be hired and more likely to be promoted to succeed I've seen real life evidence of this. And at my current age, I wish I had protected my youth better. But much like investing, the time to start, if you haven't already, is right now. Protect the skin under your eyes, in the corners of your eyes, your forehead. Uh, if you're like me, protect your bald head. Uh, Kevin O'Leary is a great example. He takes great care of his skin and himself and it shows but even he likely wishes he started earlier and you will too uh, so start today it's the best you can do right or enhance your current regime what more can you do it is much easier to protect than it is to regain that is an understatement to be sure number 43 books reading books almost all the wealthy engage in this activity not just documentaries or videos or podcasts, but actively engaging in reading books. Now, I have wondered, is this habit an archaic throwback to what was previously the only long-term form of passing information and knowledge to another mind? Or does reading activate and exercise the muscles of the mind, thereby increasing our intelligence and total output of thinking power that our brains can produce, which would logically follow as an advantage in the pursuit of wealth. I tend to agree with the latter, the thinking power that it increases our intelligence. I personally need to read more books than I do, but still I am reading some books and I can feel the effects on my brain in nearly the same way that I can feel a good workout at the gym hours or even days later. Like all exercise, it must be consistent. Tip, set reading goals, meet them, and then reward yourself for meeting them. Number 44, get credit karma. Sign up at creditkarma.ca. Now, I am in no way sponsored. I am saying this because they have been, at no charge, an incredible resource to me with timely credit alerts and a way to track my credit building progress. And did I mention it's free? It does no harm that I can personally foresee to have credit karma. Uh, it presents potential new credit or extended credit opportunities. Um, most importantly, it sends you email alerts when there are changes to your report. That seems like an obvious free benefit to almost anyone. Note that Credit Karma only presents TransUnion scores. Uh, and TransUnion is only one of two Canadian credit bureaus. So Canadians, you can also get a free credit monitoring account from the other bureau directly from Equifax, uh, Google Canadian Equifax 
or go to Equifax.ca. Now, the Equifax report right now, at least mine, is not nearly as clear or as helpful as the Credit Karma TransUnion report. To me, it looks like a halfway finished project in comparison to Credit Karma. But remember, different bureaus track slightly differently, and the most prudent life course is to monitor both bureaus for any credit progress, but especially for potential fraud. Number 45. Follow up after meetings by reaching out. By text, email, personal letter, thank them for the conversation and time. This will likely have them thinking pleasantly of you in a long-term way, which, especially in small communities like most Canadian cities and towns, this could be absolutely invaluable. Number 46. Wait until the last day before you are late to pay your utility, internet, and phone bills. Keep the money that you had budgeted for those bills in an interest-bearing checking or savings account, like Tangerine Checking or Coast Capital High Interest Saving. Both of those have interest rates. That way, you are the one making money off your money for the most possible time, not them. Tip. Don't risk your bill money by putting it into something like crypto, for example, trying to get even greater gains. The consequences of failure will be at minimum late penalties. You are risking a budget shortfall, possibly credit issues. These can turn into downward spirals quickly. Find that sweet line of the last day to guarantee the utilities will get their payment on time. And then you can make yourself a little money in the process. Maybe only a couple dollars a year, but let me go ahead and claim this quote right now. The biggest rivers are fed by many creeks. Number 47. Create household efficiencies through organization. Hmm. I must admit, this is still an ongoing learning process for me. It's easy enough to do at work, but in my case, uh, the house has been traditionally more neglected, relatively. However, a boost in efficiency by a small investment in organization around the home can save your valuable time, and the payoff could be pretty big. Some people incorporate meal planning, they prepare their weekly work outfits in advance, and I admire these levels, and I hope to get there one day. But I'm personally on the level where organizing my shirt closet by type of shirt was considered a significant life victory. So you find the efficiencies that best suit you and never feel guilty for investing the time it takes to implement them because ultimately it will pay off financially and it could, in theory, boost your precious mental health levels as well. Number 48. Share your video streaming subscriptions with family and friends, and vice versa, of course. Um, even if the big companies eventually charge for sharing, the charge will still be significantly less than two separate accounts. Or so I heard on a tech discussion show on the AM radio. So how this hack has worked for me is I pay only, personally, for Amazon Prime. I share that with a friend who needs it, and he shares that with his dad. Uh, Amazon comes for me with tons of other benefits, not to mention I own a small chunk of it, and I always try to support the companies I own. Now, Netflix, that same friend I just mentioned that's using my Amazon, uses my, uh, he covers the cost of Netflix, and then I get access. Disney Plus comes through a family member who is kind enough to spare me an account on there. YouTube, I bear the ads, so no one pays. Even if uh, someone did have premium, I would be hesitant to share a YouTube account because Google is too invasive. There could be privacy concerns. There could be unintended access concerns. So I get these four top video streaming services and all Amazon Prime benefits for the price of Amazon Prime alone. 
and I am immensely grateful to the good people who have shared their Netflix and Disney with me. Uh, building economic circles with friends and family can be invaluable, but it is not risk-free. Choose any economic partner very cautiously. Number 49. Fighting the urge to online shop and know the best time to pull out. So, we all have things we like to buy online. Temptation is everywhere, and it is likely that your social media and your news is saturated with advertising targeted towards things that big data knows that you like. So you get pulled in. You are on the site. You've added the minimum needed to get free shipping, and you're ready to check out. I find, psychologically, this part right before I enter my credit card number is the best place to back out of this deal. <laughs> Close the window. You can always go back and you'll find your card waiting for you. But right now, right at that moment, before you put in your card, get out. Close the window. Think about it harder when you're out of the danger zone. Do you really need this item? Can you live without it? Is it truly within your budget to buy this item? Remember, you are striving for freedom here. And every dollar you invest can bring you closer to that freedom. Spending will only trap you longer. The choice is yours. Number 50. Piggy banks work. Yes, they do. For those minimal transactions that you are doing with cash, put the change in a piggy bank style savings device. Every six months or so, you can take it and use it to cover an upcoming expense, freeing up that money in your budget for more investing or on occasion, treat yourself. Hey, you got to do that once in a while. Tomorrow is never guaranteed. Reward yourself for achievements. That is a winning cycle to get into. Number 51, always dress like you're going to run into someone important. <laughs> I have far too many stories of making a quick run to the garbage room or to the gas station and running into someone I would have been better off making a better impression with, I could have easily avoided that with a few extra seconds of effort. So dress reasonably well, stay clean and hygienic at all times, at least when you are leaving the house. Number 52, avoid paying for images if you can help it. There are tons of websites out there that offer royalty-free images for the great price of absolutely free. One great example I just found is unsplash.com, U-N-S-P-L-A-S-H.com. That was a great website. Now, I realize it's tough to compete with the quality of, of paid stock images, and if that's what you need, you have to do what you have to do. But at least give it a try on the free site. Try to save that money if you can. Why not? Tip number 53, don't buy stocks at market open. Generally, there is a surge of buying right off the bat. Uh, maybe from orders placed in advance or maybe from the anticipation. Anticipation, yeah. Uh, buying will typically cool off and reveal the underlying selling pressures. This isn't always true. There's always exceptions. The stock market is entirely unpredictable by its nature, but I would say more often than not. Um, so if the selling pressure is higher than the day's average buying pressure, then the prices will be lower um, than market open. So save a few cents and wait for that cool off. It lets you judge what's really happening in the market. Um, now, again, remember, there may be exceptions to this. This is a generalization. And it can go either way, but otherwise, I uh, generally do not buy stocks at market open. Number 54, don't waste time on toxic people. And I'm sorry to say this, but this can even include family members, old friends. As you work your way up in the universe, you will unfortunately need to leave some people behind. I will always try my hardest to help those people if they seek it, 
but you cannot let anyone's unwillingness to rise up anchor you to a lower plane. If you do, you will make your own journey that much more difficult. Number 55, walk fast. Seriously, speed the heck up. Okay, for your health and wealth, ideally become aware of your body and the different muscles that are being recruited to action by your mind. They have a correct sequence of triggering and you can become in tune with this and control it actively. Uh, beyond this mind-body connection, there is simply a right way to walk with correct posture and minimal joint impact and maximum efficiency. Walking correctly and quickly can allow you to channel some truly great walking efficiencies. And this reduces your time investment, time, your most precious of resources, and the only resource more finite than Bitcoin. Ooh. Reduce your time investment into each and every activity while improving your heart health, your leg and core muscles, reducing visceral body fat, you know, tummy fat. And you probably guessed that I might say this, but I personally walk a minimum of 11,000 steps six days a week. Find your own ideal step count. Consult your medical professional and commit to it. Get to it. I have a theory that talking while walking increases oxygen requirements and therefore boosts a cardio workout. So bring a friend along on your journeys. Choose different and new routes, being mindful of safety. This seems to keep the brain active as well. Walking literally purifies the body, engaging digestive and lymphatic systems. Um, and the faster and more correctly you walk, the more than those systems will engage. The final tip, most new renditions of cheap imported fitness watches are as capable or more capable at health measurements than their overpriced counterparts. Okay, well, maybe not always, but for the money, at the very least, and I personally prefer a stingy fitness watch to make me really work hard for those step counts. Number 56, curbing the urge to spend money. A related wealth hack. Okay, so if you, like me, struggle to manage the powerful urge to be a consumer, well, we must try and resist this urge. Um, some ways of doing this make it more difficult for this spend to occur. There's a new trend where people keep a specific amount of cash on them at all times and they try to limit their spend to that cash. Mm, to that cash. Okay, well, well, maybe this works for some, but remember you are missing out on credit and debit spending rewards by using merely cash. But if you have to choose, cash budgeting is better than spending outside your budgeted amounts. Number 57. Be grateful. Be very grateful. There are almost always worse scenarios. Number 58, you don't have to call them all right. No one can predict the future. No one calls them all right. Not Kathy Wood, not me, Kevin, and certainly not Jerome Powell. This is why I personally listen to many sources and many mentors. It's worth the time investment for me, as money is really the base for any pursuits of luxuries like spiritual fulfillment and philosophy, or so claimed Aristotle, I'm sure Gandhi and Buddha beg to differ. Still, I think it may depend on culture as to what is your own personal spiritual fulfillment. But chances are, if you are listening to my videos or podcasts, having financial independence would be a nice platform for you to expand from. Bonus tips. Are your hands starting to feel a little shaky? In other words, are you thinking of selling at a loss? Listen to Cryptos R Us on YouTube for big crypto reassurance. And uh, George there has endless optimism. Add Cryptos R Us to your, to your info stream. And if you need a little stock market reassurance, you can generally go to Meet Kevin. 
He will give you multiple perspectives and raw data and a generally unbiased explanation of it, and, but keeping it generally sounding positive. And then you can at least make your own choices from the data he presents. Uh, number two, for real estate reassurance, add uh, Grant Cardone, Robert Kiyosaki, and Graham Stephan to your info routine. Uh, all those on YouTube. Um, final tip, listen to these mentors and learn from them, but do not necessarily do what they do exactly because things change with every level up. By that, I mean the investment levels of your first 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million, 10 million, and so on. These are all different levels that you'll achieve. And there's a big difference between all of them. So remember, if you have $10 million of a stock and it goes up 1% and you sell it, you just made $10,000. Stocks fluctuate on those levels all day, which makes it a way different playing field for people with $10 million compared to people like me. So money becomes easier to make the more of it you have. Um, if you have $1 billion, of which Elon Musk has hundreds of billions, then just $1 billion and 1% is $10 million. So $10 million every time a stock goes up 1%, or at the very least, this is a good illustration of how that actually works. So one thing to note, large amounts like that also suffer massive losses from small percentages. So what goes up must go down. Still, you'd be so well diversified, ideally, when you have that amount, that you would more often than not come out ahead. And that's the ideal goal of this wealth hack and all wealth hacks. You don't have to win them all, just come out ahead more often than not. Number 59, unless you're a serious gambler, avoid high risk acquisitions during a recession or otherwise hard economic times. Uh, pro tip. Not just high-risk stocks or altcoins, but consider minimizing all risk. Think about it. If you were in a skiing accident and you broke a leg and were out from work, your personal productivity may be severely reduced. So unless you're already wealthy, you can reduce your chances of pulling one of the bad cards in Monopoly. That's how I see it. Think of other risks. Avoid them. Save tons of money that way, even when the economy is decent. You'll have plenty of time to tumble down a cliff when you don't live at or near the paycheck-to-paycheck -paycheck life. Number 60. Take profits. You can't time the market. When your stock or crypto hits the amount you're predetermined to be a win, sell it. Buy more later on the next dip if the fundamentals still work for you but take your profits. And we'll just go ahead and dive right in to number 61. Support your holdings. For example, if you own Amazon stock, shop at Amazon, shop at Whole Foods. Use Alexa as your smart home system. Be an Amazon Prime subscriber. If you don't like their products, then maybe it's time to reconsider why you are investing with them. If you own Cineplex or Dollarama, well, I think you get the point. Sneak in some Dollarama candy to your next movie date. Number 62. If you don't have anything better for this already, at least, um, for easy tracking of stocks in 15-minute intervals, you can use the Google Finance app. It has a great watch list feature and it shows your biggest movers on the home screen. It also collects and links news articles related to your holdings. And um, it doesn't really do crypto. So for cryptos, I like the crypto app um, available on Google Play, probably in the Apple Store too. It has a uh, real time tracking, programmable warnings of major up and down movements. And it's a good cultivation of, of crypto news. Um, also, I'm just going to add to this Yahoo Finance, which has some great detailed uh, financials information for most stocks. Um, that being said, if you're using something like TD Bank or one of the major banks where you're paying for commissions, those will usually include real time stock tracking information. So this is only if you're using something that's commission free, like Wealthsimple, 
and you just need a little bit more detailed information than something like Wealth Simple could provide. Number 63, um, investing.com. Uh, so at investing.com, if you go to indices futures, it's a little tab there, you can actually get a sense of where the stock market is going to head the next day. Um, and so credit goes to meet Kevin for this tip. He, he's the one that presented this, but this is where you see futures. So seeing what everyone else thinks of the future with their money can help you prepare your investments for the next day. Uh, so if futures are up, then there's a good chance of a bull market the next day, perhaps a mini bull market, at least some kind of rally. If futures are down, then there's a good chance that things could travel in the wrong direction. This isn't a guarantee. I mean, sometimes this goes wrong, but it at least gives you a little bit more insight into what's going to happen the next day. Number 65, mind the consequences. So this viewpoint, this perspective has been embedded into my personal decision making since law school. And I would describe it as visualizing the chain of possible consequences to the choice at hand. I'm referring to the natural chain of consequences as um, you're generally separated from consequences where an unforeseeable intervening act causes the consequence. And with, without that act, the consequence would not have occurred. I know that sounds complicated um, and there's exceptions to such generalizations. But let me try to illustrate it with an example. If you're sweeping off your deck and you live on the seventh floor like, like I do, then it could be foreseeable as a natural consequence. If I'm sweeping stuff off the deck, like little rocks or something, and they fall and they cause somebody an injury, they get hit in the head. This is a consequence that I could be and should be held responsible for. So because I could foresee this chain of, of consequences, this causal chain, I could sweep those rocks into a dustpan, avoiding the potential consequences by breaking that causal chain. Uh, therefore, if a gust of wind takes that dustpan and flips it around and it bounces off the, the neighbor's porch and then goes down and causes a car accident, that is beyond the natural consequences of me sweeping the porch. So I would no longer be responsible. Um, another example, uh, you're driving and you change the radio station and you're looking down at the, uh, at the radio itself and you look up and you're halfway into the left lane with oncoming traffic. And this causes an oncoming driver to swerve slightly. That's foreseeable, but they lose traction and they spin out, which is fine. But the car behind them slams on the brakes, the airbag deploys and that di driver dies. Um, all of, all of that's kind of foreseeable, even though it's, it's really, it's unusual series of events, but it's foreseeable. And then all of which you're responsible for. Um, but say the driver behind you sees the accident and they overreact due to being distracted a little bit themselves. They lose traction. They suffer permanent injuries from the resultant five car pileup that they create. Um, well, then you basically have another independent cause for the accident. It's an intervening event. Now, the nuances on these get really complicated and lawyers will, are trained to argue in either direction, depending on what they're att attempting to complicate, uh, to prove. Um, but my point is the overreaction was not really a foreseeable consequence. So you can't try not to overstress about causal chains that have, um, unforeseeable events. You can't predict all that and it could drive you crazy. It, it might have driven me crazy already. Um, all I'm saying in a non-advisory way is try to predict the natural consequences of your acts and then choose your risks very carefully. Number 66, treat yourself on occasion, but do it as a reward. Train yourself like a dog. Reward achievement and accomplishment. The bigger the achievement, the bigger the reward. The future is not guaranteed, so hedge your bets by getting a little enjoyment out of life, rationed out as positive reinforcement. Number 67, be wary of service providers. Healthcare, for example, a dentist. A dentist is generally motivated primarily to generate revenue 
for themselves. They may absolutely love their job. That's irrelevant. This doesn't change the purpose of society to maximize wealth, to maximize individual prosperity. So, so therefore, that dentist will upsell. They'll accelerate timings on treatments. So be sure to ask questions. Do a full risk-benefit analysis of every service offered. And be mindful and wary of additional charges. Get a second opinion where appropriate. Not just for healthcare, though. This is any situation where you are dealing with any people or places that are revenue motivated. Mechanics, car maintenance, optometrists. Look for revenue motivation and protect yourself. Number 68. Be wary of so-called financial advisors in Canada. There are ways to use that description without necessarily going through gatekeeper agencies. And I don't really put much stock in gatekeeper agencies. That's just something to consider. So ask yourself this question. Why do you feel your financial advisor is worth paying your hard-earned money to? Very few investors can stock pick individual stocks or funds and beat the S&P 500. Sure, there's a lot of temporary exceptions, um, yeah, but you know if you're, you know if you're listening to this during the Great Crash of 2022, which we're in right now, you're probably way down right now. Here's the thing: I mean, investments go up and down in value, and if the fundamentals are still strong, then the investments should go back up when the macroeconomic environment goes back up. Timeline doesn't end right now. So can a chart reader, a technical analysis person, a financial advisor predict better than your own personal due diligence in your investments into a diversified portfolio? Um, you know, for example, could you just invest into a full S&P 500 ETF like Vanguard's VFY with its average of 10% returns if dividends are reinvested and beat most financial advisors. I mean, you have to make that call yourself. You have to make that choice. Uh, statistics show that most advisors and funds do not beat the S&P 500 as a whole. And therefore, if it's just educated guessing that you're paying these guys to do, you really need to pay those steep fees for risk that may be no different from your own well thought out choices. Again, your choice. But I personally choose to avoid as many fees as I can as you guys know, that's why I use Wealth Simple Bank, Wealth Simple Bank for stock and crypto trading. Because there's no stock trade commission fees, there's no minimum balance. You can do fractional trading and tons of other features. So if you're interested, you can sign up and try it from the link in the description. If you do that, you'll get the cash value of two random stocks, and I'll get the cash value of one random stock. And I'll feel overjoyed that this podcast has provided a tiny cash flow. And it will justify all the hours that I spend on this. In the final wealth hack for today, number 70, uh, you will take some losses. The big L, you'll take some L's. And you should take some losses. You have to measure potential losses against potential gains. Here's an example for you. Meet Kevin sold his entire stock portfolio in the first quarter of this year at a loss. And he did this because those sales boosted his capital gains losses, which could be applied at tax time to offset his capital gains, thereby reducing the amount of taxes that he's paid. Um, and so think of the following cost benefit analysis that, cost benefit analysis that he applied. So stock is about to drop 30%. It's right now at 10% down. Okay, but he's predicting that over you know, the next period of time, it's going to drop a full 30%. So if he sells now and then at 10% and he buys again when it's 30% down, then he's technically avoided 20% of potential realized loss. So what's the catch, right? Because the catch is, I mean, Kevin didn't know. He doesn't know. If, if, and how far the stock will drop in price. So one can only make their best attempt to economically divine the future. Now meet Kevin 
has a vast knowledge of economics and he stays very well in tune with what is going on, which is why I recommend watching him, even though he's an American. And I believe that the more awareness and knowledge and experience one has gives some advantages in many ways. There's still no knowing of the outcome, and it se- but it seems like, and at least in this example, and it's too, too soon to truly judge, but meet Kevin's assessments and decisions seem to have worked out well for him so far. So as you can see my point, losses can be used intentionally and strategically to mitigate a bigger loss. Number 71. Not all wealth hacks and finance tips, etc., will apply to you or benefit you. This goes for all of the vast information that is available on all financial topics. Um, the best outcome, the best outcome that I can personally see mathematically, is to analyze as much information as possible to filter in the beneficial knowledge, and then concentrate your sources after that for efficiency as in find the ones that are giving you the best information and best benefit and focus more on those uh one little tip here be very wary of confirmation bias this is uh when you are analyzing new knowledge as to whether it supports your current narrative um rather than just being fair when you're listening to it. So don't just listen to things that support what you already believe. Uh, That's what confirmation bias is. It's best to assess with a cold, hard, deductive logic as far as you can. Number 72, if you are granted a second chance on a stock or crypto, other than Bitcoin, that has gone down since you bought it, and by this I mean say it comes back up, you've exceeded your value, but you feel like the fundamentals aren't really there for a bigger push. Uh, And it stalls out there when it's coming back up. Well, don't give into greed here and think, well, maybe if I just wait and uh, it will come back up. I mean, maybe it will, but that's one heck of a gamble. Uh, One that I've seen more advanced investors than myself fall prey to as well as myself. So if it if it falls and you're just hoping every day for it to come back up so that you can sell it and then it does actually come back up, don't give in to the greed emotion that appears. Um, always stick to your plans, to your strategies, even if it is a hold until break even strategy. Better luck on the next pick. That kind of plan. Um, so note, I don't include Bitcoin in my strategy here. Bitcoin to me is much like a savings account. Um, not really necessary to sell it. Um, and if you, if you have gains on it, you don't incur a capital gains tax on it for selling. Um, and given it's, it's long-term potential, I, I personally at least just let it sit and go up in value over time as it becomes more and more scarce. Uh, that's the plan anyways. And I also keep a significant amount of the purpose spot Bitcoin ETF, BitCB, as I call it btcy.b on the Toronto Stock Exchange uh, because the yield on the stock has typically been at least over 7 or 8% on a monthly dividend payout, and it's been a consistent, strong payout monthly. Um, so I've had this for, for a few months now, and it's uh, still doing an excellent job. So I'll continue to report back on, on BitCB. Um, and it doesn't seem to exactly track Bitcoin... <laughs> and its volatility, but more so that of the stock market, uh, the tech sector particularly. It, it, it's uh, interesting how the, it's separate in its tracking. Um, and right now it's less than $5.50 Canadian, so I think it's an absolute bargain in my opinion for this ETF right now. Um, it is worth doing your due diligence and checking into it. Number 73, in a volatile market. Check your portfolio often to capitalize on sudden spikes that may come and go just as quickly. Um, So many apps allow you to set alerts and notifications at price targets. Wealth Simple allows three free alerts, and you can get more with their premium package. Um, And you might be able to make some extra money on surprise swings that way to meet your threshold level at least. 
right now, if um, my threshold level can be around 10% for a non-defensive stock, for a growth stock. So I'll take the profit. Remember some of my other tips to layer in and layer out. You don't necessarily go all in and all out with your position um, at every point. So check out my other podcast for more information on layering in and layering out. Um, okay. So you can always reestablish a position and you can and should layer in and layer out, uh, which basically means don't buy or sell all in one chunk unless you're executing a pre-made plan like in, in the previous tip. Um, so if I see a big defensive stock like HUTL on the Toronto Stock Exchange, which is a um, ETF, a covered call ETF of global energy, if I see that go up 10%, I'm going to sell around 10 shares or, or 10% of uh, my holdings at a time, keeping most of my position, but then taking a little profit too. Um, and then reinvest that money into something that's on sale in, in this bear market, preferably something with dividends. That's my personal strategy, at least. Number 74, changing cell phone companies can hurt your credit score. Um, so credit bureaus average the age of all your credit accounts. So if you close an account that is five years old to save $5 a month by switching, you may significantly reduce your average credit age as closed accounts no longer count. And a brand new account will seriously bring down um, that average credit age. So keep that in mind before casually switching accounts. Can your existing company perhaps be convinced to give you whatever deal you're about to get? It's certainly worth a try. And note, this also goes for so-called sister companies like TELUS and KUDO or Rogers and FIDO. So the credit bureaus count them as being completely different companies. And remember, uh, if you damage your credit score or your credit rating, then you'll get higher interest rates on borrowing. So you could end up spending a lot more than you save if, uh, if you're damaging your credit. So just be wary, my fellow Canadians. Because the better your credit score, the better your chances of getting lower interest rates, um, especially in this time where the government continues to increase the base interest rate, which is pushing all the interest rates up. Wealth hack number 75, get a neutral third party perspective. So over time, it is easy to get caught up in your own biases, fears, and self-imposed limitations and if you're in the same crowd, then again, you may be just trapped in, in that uh, relatively confined world of, of thoughts and beliefs. So a life coach or another third party might be able to shine a light to help guide you to new things. So if you're feeling stagnant or on a plateau, break open that shell with a third party perspective. Wealth hack number 76 maximize and multiply your passive income streams. I say this a lot, but in this hack specifically, I'm talking about getting paid to walk. So every step, pay me. Some apps that pay you to walk are Optimity and WinWalk. So it's not a huge payout. I'm not talking about a windfall here, but why not get paid for every step? So this might be a possible exercise incentive as well. And, you know, I can't say this enough, health equals wealth. And uh, it's the most, most important thing you can uh, spend your money on. But when I get paid for being more healthy, even better. So I prefer out of those two between Windwalk and Optimity, I prefer Optimity as it gives you the chance to redeem uh, gems, which is what you earn for walking, into more points or Petro points. You can also get gift cards, other things, but I want more points, occasionally Petro points. So more points are the save on foods, reward points, and Petro points are from Petro Canada and their network, respectively. Uh, so if you would be so kind to hook me up for my wealth hack efforts and you get Optimity, you can enter my referral code, which is A and D. R E six three seven oh three A N D R E six three seven oh three. 
Uh, so please jot it down, grabbing some paper right now. Uh, A-N-D-R-E-63703. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so note, if you use a Huawei watch and you want maximum steps in either Windwalk or Optimity, you're going to need the Google Fit app. And you'll have to sync from the Huawei to the Google Fit, um, which requires a third-party app called Health Sync. But it does a, a decent job so far. Um, do note that getting a third-party app, all this stuff is going to require giving a lot of uh, permissions to read your health data. So make sure that you're, you know, you're choosing consciously here when you're uh, giving away your health data. So it's time to get paid for every step you make. Uh, so check out the Optimity app. And again, please write down my referral code if you'd be so kind. A-N-D-R-E-63703. Thanks, guys. Wealth hack number 77, find mentors. Find people and knowledge resources. Uh, so they don't have to be actual humans. They can just be a resource of knowledge, um, but that are somewhat ahead of you. It doesn't have to be drastically ahead of you. Ideally, somebody that's just a few steps further than you are so that they have that fresh knowledge from where your point in time is in your journey. And so find these people or resources, learn from them, and apply this knowledge to your goals as needed. Um, so again, these don't have to be personal friends. They could be YouTube channel hosts like Meet Kevin, for example. But if possible, strive to make up your peer group of people, your friends, with similar goals as yourself, and even better, with various, various degrees of advancement from you. I mean, that'd be ideal. You're not going to get every single person in your peer group like that. It's unlikely, but um, certainly a goal. And learn from them. Not everything they do will apply, but some of it will. And every tidbit of knowledge that helps you along your personal path is absolutely priceless. Wealth hack number 78. So Google Finance. It's an app. Great app. I love it. Um, and... It has a list of futures markets in there. Um, so to get there, install the app, of course. Look at the top of the app's homepage. And on the left, look for the words compare markets. Then slide that text line to the left with your finger until you get to futures. And, uh, and check that out. And so remember from the most recent podcast of mine that futures... Uh, futures will allow you to somewhat predict what color the stock market will be in the morning at market open if you're checking at night or what the direction of the stock market what the direction of the stock market will be so if the futures are all green then expect the stock market to go up because people are betting that it will and it tends to pull in that direction um, and if it's mixed green and red in the futures then it's probably going to be volatile all day um, so there may be opportunities in there, but it's going to be rough water. So be careful. And then if finally, if it's all red, well, things could be pretty ugly. This could be, though, a good opportunity to buy a dip. So checking out futures, which you can get to uh, with the Google Finance app, which I find to be an extremely useful app. Wealth hack number 79, and this, uh, this might seem obvious, but I'm not sure I've emphasized it enough, so I'm going to go ahead and emphasize it again right here. Uh, buy in bear markets. Buy when things are down and people are scared and people's investments are bleeding. That is when you buy, when the sell-offs are happening and things are at the bottom and people are like, why am I even in stocks? That is when you buy because eventually it will come back up. Um, bull markets are dangerous times to buy. But ultimately, that is when most people buy. Literally, most people buy. That's when most people come into the stock market for the very first time. That's when they buy. So just remember, buy low, sell high. Buy low, sell high. Simple but effective formula. Stock up on the sales stocks. And always remember, you can't time the market. Wealth hack 80, don't fight the Fed. When there's quantitative easing, the money printer goes burr. When the money printer goes burr, then stocks, Bitcoin, and other cryptos tend to attract 
They tend to attract investments and investors, increasing their price, increasing their values, which creates this cycle of fear of missing out, which continues to push the prices up. Uh, conversely, when the Fed does quantitative tightening uh, by increasing interest rates and selling assets on their books, well, riskier assets, most assets, tend to lose investors. Uh, and then current investments are reduced in value, causing decreases in spending, causing fear, causing liquidation, um, causing people to hoard their, their cash, if they have any, perhaps to the point where the entire economy of the country fails to grow for two consecutive quarters, in other words, a recession. So don't expect things to turn around again until quantitative easing is back on the table. Otherwise, it could be what they call a bull trap in a bear market. So prices overall are trending downward, and while they're occasionally spiking back up, they're going typically less up than they were the last time they spiked because it's trending downward. Um, this is a, a bad market to attempt to win in, although, again, there's always opportunities here. Yeah, especially if you're doing swing trading, buying low and selling high. But if you're investing long term, uh, this is just a good time to survive on strategies like number one, dollar cost averaging, continuing to buy the assets while they're on sale, keeping in mind that they could get even cheaper. Number two, keeping relatively high cash levels so that you can scoop up on what seem like extreme dips. So uh, number three, dividend income asset purchases. So uh, stuff that pays you to own it so that you can keep the cash flow rolling. And finally, number four, diversification or asset bundling so that you can minimize extreme downward spikes as much as possible. One example being an index ETF that tracks a large number of stocks or maybe a large REIT, a real estate investment trust ETF, which contains diverse types of real estate. Something where if one or two of the individual holdings starts to fall dramatically, it will be averaged out by the ones that are still holding steady. Keep in mind that if we were in a bull market, uh, over diversification can keep you from getting major wins because as certain uh, individual stocks spike upwards, the ones that are not are going to average you out. So it's a balance, but as a defensive play, um, diversified asset bundling uh, can help you hedge the risk. Wealth hack number 81. Okay, this is specific to an app called Optimity. This is an app you can download on iPhone or Android that pays you in rewards points to walk. So if you scroll down on the main page, there's an ad video that can be watched that will 2x your point. And this seems to be available daily. So 2x your walking points means that pretty much every two days you can either get more Petro Canada points or more Save on Foods points, uh, the more points. So that uh, adds up quite quickly and definitely worth it to 2x it every day. It takes 15 seconds of your, your life. It's worth it. Okay, wealth hack number 82. Okay, this is in the same vein as wealth hack 81. There's an app called Wealth Simple Cash. So if you're part of the Wealth Simple world, you know they have comparatively low fees and great products. And if you're not part of that world and you're interested, please use the link in the description to get us both some free money when you sign up. Anyway, back to Wealth Simple Cash. So I can get PayPal to instant transfer to the Well Simple Cash for 1%. Okay, ouch, but money now is always better than money later. Okay, sometimes. Uh, using this for uh, limited spending money within the budget, I can then get an additional 1% cash back that's immediately converted into Bitcoin. So it's convenient, it's a nice way to get some extra Bitcoin, and... Um, you could choose a different crypto if you were so inclined, but right now it's the summer of 2022. It's the big crypto crash, and right now Bitcoin is the safest, safest of the cryptocurrency hedges by a vast, vast margin. 
Wealth hack number 83, study and analyze your competition in business, in life, in your income streams, because success leaves clues. So there may be things you can copy. There will, there will ideally be things that uh, level you up because of your unique skills and abilities. So this is how you can get ahead a little bit quicker. This approach can shorten the time of your learning curve compared to only learning from your own mistakes. Wealth hack 84, swish water around your mouth after eating and drinking non-water liquids or foods. So this clears food particles out, helps neutralize sugars and acids a little bit without overly neutralizing beneficial bacteria in the mouth. This technique can help you reduce expensive and time-consuming dentist visits, thereby saving money, and the fresher breath may prove useful in networking and social interactions, and we all know that contacts equal contracts. And if you did know that contacts equal contracts, please go back and check out my Wealth Hacks series one through eight. They are full of great Wealth Hacks to help me save as much money as I can for investing. Wealth Hack 85, master your nutrition to maximize your productivity and protect slash enhance your health. Your nutritional needs will be individual to you, but I will give you my example specific to me. So I'm a 40-year-old quasi-athletic with no allergies or underlying health conditions other than general aging and above average wear and tear. And here's my ideal diet. In the mornings, uh, I get 0% fat Greek yogurt with some added chia seeds that I purchased in bulk. Um, and then I take Reservatrol, DIM, Focus Factor Brain Nutrition, Plasma Logins, Turmeric and Curcumin with Black Pepper for Absorption, Tonkat Ali, Ginseng, Green Tea Extract, Ashwagandha, Salt Palmetto, and typically Folgers Coffee, black with some unsweetened vanilla almond milk. Um, and then some concentrated polyphenols uh, in a liter of water. For lunch, when I finish my day job, generally involves high fiber, high protein, whole grain carbs, dinner, bowl of organic flax seeds or other ancient grain cereal. And this is spiked by some more black coffee throughout the day. And yes, there are cheat days where my mom or my partner will lead me to some fancy meal. And thankfully I can absorb those, although I do see a small spike in weight for a few days after. What can I say? Put it in front of me, I'll finish my plate. Okay. Finally, at night, I'll take a Kapow Overnight Anabolic Booster, which has melatonin, lemon balm, L-theanine, chamomile, valerian root, also has tribulus, ashwagandha, DIM, fenugreek, and stinging nettle extract. Okay, so I have a Huawei Fit to Watch, and I track my sleep precisely. And this uh, combination and process along with limiting my caffeine intake to before 6 p.m., that kind of thing, um, has proven effective for giving me quality sleep, uh, which basically means getting enough deep sleep in your sleep. Uh, so this is a nutrition plan that's been working for me personally, this plus a 10,000 step per day minimum and daily cal calisthenics with rest days as needed. This keeps me lit, fit, lean, fit, generally healthy, and this equals massive productivity, which is why this is a wealth hack. I get a lot of stuff done each and every day. I'm just, I'm driven anyways, and then with this proper nutrition that I've mapped out that's best for me, that keeps me going. So you need to create, you should ideally create a map, a nutritional map that works for you. And, and an exercise map, something specific to you that can get you this kind of productivity that I personally have, and you can definitely do it. Wealth hack 86, avoid using Telegram, WhatsApp, WeChat, etc. if you can. Sometimes you have to use it for business, I do, I don't like it, but especially Telegram, and my reasoning is this, uh, regular texting works just fine for us Canadians. We have access to cheap and unlimited texting, or we should. Worst case, use Facebook Messenger if you can't get unlimited texting, but otherwise, if you can, generally avoid apps like Telegram and WeChat. They are packed full of scammers and spy functions and security compromises. Just try to avoid these. 
Well pack 87. Know when to break. Pause. Conserve your energy. As they told us in law school, it is a marathon, not a sprint. This applies to the whole life and economics game too. Stay in touch and in line with your mind, body, and spirit. Wealth hack 88, cold showers. Okay, wait, wait, hear me out. So what I do is I get in the shower, I turn it on, and then I get blasted under the cold water initially. I spin around and I make noises like an excited Star Wars droid. Then the water warms and I'm left feeling totally revitalized, energetic, and with a much boosted immune system. And all these characteristics can lead to more wealth. It's a small sacrifice. You can take it. You can take it. Okay. Wealth Hack 89. Let's talk about short selling. This is a tool of the already wealthy. Short selling is a bet that the stock or the crypto will fall to a lower value. These are typically done at premium brokers like Quest Trade or major banks, and you pay a trading commission fee for each bet you make. And you pay pretty significant fees for buying, selling, and bets at these kind of uh, brokerages. But that can be lucrative to the already wealthy because they're playing on such a big scale. What do they care about a $5 fee? Hence, uh, this is a tool of the already wealthy. But for, for us, uh, beginner and intermediate investors, we should be aware that short sellers, also known as bears, um, because they're betting on the loss of stock value, and so they have an interest in having these values decline. These bears are always trying to beat the bulls. Um, so if you're hoping for an increase, you're a bull. So if you're a bull, be aware and be wary of bears. Both bulls and bears tend to do quite well. And many experienced investors can flip between bull and bear quite fluently, doing whatever benefits the most. But watch out when the bears are stacked up because they have a vested interest in keeping that value price down um, until their bet expires, basically, which is when they call the bet. Like, is it low enough? Okay, then you get paid. Um, so they're waiting on those. These seem to typically happen on Fridays, the expire. So you what you'll see like the price of Bitcoin or something held down by bears. Um, so watch out for that because everything else could be going well from a macro perspective, and you're like, why is this price stagnant? It could be there are a lot of shorts, um, a lot of bets against that value going up. Wealth hack number ninety. It's okay to invest in yourself and into more assets for yourself. When being frugal, it can be very tough to decide when it is okay to spend money. But this can be broken down into a cost-benefit analysis. What is the cost? What is the benefit? Are the benefits greater than the cost? Let's take a look at this with a recent example of mine. All my life I've used second-hand hand-me-down computers. These generally have been bare-bone units, although reliable. But subconsciously, knowing I was going to become a quasi-famous YouTuber and being a master of the technical arts and digital marketing, I justified the purchase of a lower-end but high-performance laptop with strong graphics capabilities for four times more than I paid for any previous laptop in my life at, at a grand $800 Canadian. In the long term, this was a critical and essential foundational purchase for all things business that came after that purchase. It was a worthy investment, and I don't regret it. And being such a relatively big investment, I am inspired to push this laptop to the limits almost daily to maximize my returns. My thoughts here are, once you have decided the investment is critical and that the benefits outweigh the cost, even on a very long time horizon, then you can proceed with your investment with no regrets. You can always make more money, and often, I say this often, you have to pay to play. Number 91, ground yourself in nature periodically. Walk in a forest, sit at the beach, climb a mountain. Lots of, lots of possibilities here, but make sure to take the time for the sake of your physical, spiritual, and mental health. Um, take the time to get these essential foundations for building and enjoying wealth. So ground yourself. Wealth hack number 92, prioritize yourself. Loyalty, a trait considered most virtuous can actually be quite harmful when you're consistently placing the needs of others above your own. Is there some kind of moral scorecard as seen in the Netflix hit show, The Good Place? I don't know the answer to that. 
I do know that the more personal power and wealth that you have, the more time freedom you have. Proportionally, the more potential you have for helping the greatest amount of people to the greatest degree. Now, there are possible exceptions, but no one can deny that financial freedom, available budget for philanthropy, and the connections that come with being in such a position can put you in the best possible place for helping others. Therefore, if you don't have these precursor conditions, then it makes sense to me at least to focus on achieving them. Even at the cost of acting in a way that appears selfish or self-centered, so that soon enough you can make so much more impact. 93. Write follow-up letters. Emails are fine. This gives you a huge advantage. Sales, jobs, whatever. Stand out above your competition, up your networking game, write a follow-up letter. That's what the pros do. 94. Personal line of credit in your checking account. This is better than overdraft protection, as long as it's used sparingly and strategically. It can be an important part of your personal finance arsenal. Use your personal line of credit in lieu of credit cards or in combination with a pay your credit card back within the grace period method in order to gain both rewards points and to maximize the time available for your interest-free loan. Uh, check out the link in the description if you need more information on line of credit versus credit cards. What the heck is that? Check in the description. Wealth hack number 95 know when to move quickly and just start recognize limited time opportunities and seize them if you're a creator with an idea get started with the idea a contractor with a proposed contract get to work you get the point fight that indignation that comes with a surprise invite to work when you're not expecting it uh, i think we've all felt that and instead capitalize there's plenty of time for freedom when you are actually free you know, when working becomes optional. Wealth hack 96. Okay, this Amazon Prime membership fee reduction hack is really specific, but worth noting. So, you can convert to an annual payment with Prime at 99 Canadian per year, and then you save 20%. And if you um, pay uh, your su subscriptions like Amazon or Netflix with your Canadian Tire triangle card, you can get an additional $10 in Canadian Tire money which works like cash in Canadian tire stores. So basically I'm now getting prime at 30% less than what most people pay. So being, being an investor in both Amazon and Canadian tire, I benefit from the success of everything involved in this financial ecosystem. I do this with quite a lot of these uh, financial ecosystems, Shoppers Drug Mart, Save on Foods. Um, I have a piece of everything, why not? On a broader note, building these ecosystems is a great way to compound your financial benefits. Like I was just saying, wealth hack number 97, know when to take a break. So when you hustle nonstop, like, like many of us do, like I personally do, eventually your body, your mind, your spirit, they start to fragment to no longer work in unison. This could lead to illness or even worse. So learn to recognize your own personal symptoms of overstress, burnout. Take the time to do what you need to do to correct. Go walk barefoot on a sandy beach, whatever works for you. Remember that the consequences of overstress can cost you more in the long run as you could botch opportunities, you could make mistakes, you could deal with the productivity consequences of poor health. It's not worth it. 98, Wealth Hack 98, learn logical fallacies and um, cognitive biases as well. Some of you might know, or maybe you don't know what they are at all, and that's okay, but just Google this, logical fallacies cognitive biases, or even better, search for it on YouTube, learn the top 20 of each. Okay, so what these are, logical fallacies, these are ways that people try to make points that aren't true, but it often sounds as if their arguments are logical. They aren't logical, and these arguments have been identified as logical fallacies, basically false logic. Bonus tip, uh, look up cognitive biases as well, same kind of thing. There are a few biases that our brains are using to bypass logic in our own perception and in our own assimilation of knowledge. But awareness of what these biases are can help you see through such fallacies and biases. It's worth it. Wealth Hack 99, freezers are expensive to run. Keeping your fridge and freezer full can reduce the amount of energy needed to maintain the temperature. But who can afford food these days 
Use Ziploc bags of water to fill in the gaps in the freezer. Costs less to run and keep it cold. Wealth hack number 100, final wealth hack. Beware of shortcuts that seem too good to be true. Like automated YouTube cash cow channels, for example. Um, a lot of the services provided by Fiverr, for another example. Always read the fine print when you're venturing into new investment territory. Do your due diligence. Pace yourself. Thank you for listening to all 100 wealth hacks. As a reward for your perseverance, please enjoy these bonus editions. Tips on fighting debt, learn how to make monthly income off real estate stocks, and three more investing tips I haven't seen elsewhere. May the market force be with you. If you like this audiobook, please like, comment, and subscribe. It helps my channel tremendously, and it's all I ask in return, so thank you. Fellow Canadians, check out the link in the description for Wealth Simple. Commission-free trading, in my opinion, it is the best way for beginning investors to not get ripped off by big banks when they are learning how to make trades. So let's get started with these bonuses. Not all of us are debt-free and ready to enjoy a life of positive net worth. A sword called debt hangs over our head, and the stress of having this debt can be crushing. It's easy for many mentors to say, pay off your debt first. But can they truly understand and empathize with the cycle of poverty, which involves throwing countless dollars toward high interest debt? I'm sharing the strategy that I would use based on insights from both mentors and personal victories in the great war against debt. Having spent most of my life in a poverty mindset, I am all too familiar. Here are some tips for you to consider as you build your anti-debt war chest. Number one, refinance at lower interest rates. How hard is this? Not that hard. Using what's called a debt consolidation loan. Here's the theory. Credit cards charge up to 29% interest. The more interest you pay, the longer it will take to pay off the debt with the same amount of payment. Therefore, the debt consolidation loan comes in and pays off your high interest debt and it lets you pay it back at a more reasonable interest rate. For example, Coast Capital Savings will offer you this debt consolidation loan at the market rate, which at this time is around 6.4%. Now, this isn't as great as, say, paying less than 6.4%, but you can really feel the difference compared to even 14.99% and above. And if you have other loans, like a car loan, that are at a high interest rate, you can pay these off with your credit cards, then get the debt consolidation loan to pay off your credit cards, leaving you with a hefty debt consolidation loan at a relatively reasonable interest rate, lower than your car loan, lower than your credit cards. Then any extra funds that you uh, come up with, call your bank, have them pay it towards the principal of this debt consolidation loan. This will further reduce the amount of interest you will be paying in total. Number two, balance transfer offers. These offers typically will let you use one credit card to pay off another for a 1% fee, giving you 0% interest for X amount of time. You can shuffle a lot of credit card debt into 0% interest using these balance transfers. But of course, curb your spending, whatever it takes. Don't continue adding to your debt and do everything you can to pay off as much as possible of that debt before that interest kicks in again, often at a slightly higher rate than before. Number three, pay off your debts in order of the highest interest rate. Seems obvious, but this is often overlooked in favor of the pay the smallest balance down first so that one card is paid off at a time strategy. Keep an eye on the big picture. Number four, once your debt is completely covered at a rate that is less than 7%, you can then consider starting to invest 
a percentage of your income above expenses into long-term safe investments with yields of 7% or higher. These would typically be ETFs, which is a bundle of stocks that spans the entire stock market or a big chunk of it. This will reduce your risk overall and historically will provide 7% or more in returns. Number five, be frugal. Use coupons, negotiate utility bills, beg, plea, threaten within the boundaries of the law. Do what it takes to reduce each and every one of your expenses. Get the smaller size drink, even if it is a worse deal per liter. Buy the generic brand. Get the slower internet. Go without cable TV. Get the crappier phone. Skip Starbucks days. You're getting the point, I'm sure. Some say, well, life isn't worth living without the little things. Fair enough. But you know what? Take a few years to live in a frugal way. And when your debt is under control, you can go back to the steady stream of little things that you love so much. You may find you are no longer as interested, as by then you will learn that coffee will buy you another share of a Canadian Riot, which will pay you seven cents per month just to own it. So enough coffee is, well, enough shares of that Riot, and working becomes optional. You become free. And seriously, that's what life is all about. I promise it is worth a few years of living frugally. How to receive rent, rental income every month without being a landlord for as little as $6 to start. This is a passive income creation strategy that can be scaled infinitely. It involves earning monthly payments called dividends from owning stocks and groups of stocks that pay such dividends. Now, first of all, if you really want to start and pay uh, around like $6 to get in, you will need a commission-free trading platform. I recommend Wealth Simple for this, and I have a link for it in the description of this podcast. Um, otherwise, if you go to, say, TD Bank or you know even Quest Trade, you're paying a commission fee, and so um, you'll be paying five dollars, ten dollars on top of the cost of the share stock, and that's not really a, a way to get in, you know, on, on such a level. But with Wealth Simple, you can literally put in six dollars and buy a share that would start paying you monthly income, which is really pretty amazing. So once you have uh, Wealth Simple set up on your phone, once you have the platform set up, you are ready to choose your monthly dividend paying stocks. Uh, so today we will go into the different kinds of stocks that pay monthly dividends. However, please note that many investors would suggest stocks that track the index of all stocks, you know, um, ETFs, basically bundles of stocks that track all the other stocks is the best way to earn the maximum amount of money for your investment over a long time period. So they're basically saying that passive income, sure, it's great, but you can make even more money investing in to the stock index, you know, like the S&P 500 or something like that um, over a long enough time period. I personally uh, like a balance between both worlds. So uh, my portfolio, which has a 20 to 25 year time horizon, um, that's how long I figure I can go before I need to cash in on all this. Um, so I, I split my, and balance my portfolio between stocks that will grow in value that track the index or just other growth stocks and stocks that provide passive income. Um, I feel the two balance each other out. So when the market is weak, I'm constantly still getting that passive income. When the market is strong, like it is right now, then um, then my assets grow in value. Um, so the, these two things work together, and I'm still getting the passive income. It's really just great for everyone when the market is strong. So number one, the first kind of monthly dividend payer, the REIT, R-E-I-T. It stands for Real Estate Investment Trust. So with a REIT, 
you are literally providing money for property investors to buy property that they rent out to people. So you're bankrolling these guys. And then they go out and they buy a property and they rent it out. So you will get paid a percentage of that rent. And most of the time, they already own most of the properties already. You're just buying in after the fact. And then you're getting paid a percentage of that rent. So uh, some of the REITs that I like are TSX, which stands for the Toronto Stock Exchange, SOT.UN, SOT.UN. Now note, most REITs end in .UN as a trader symbol. So SOT.UN, this is a Slate Office Properties, and this is one that is less than $6 a share. So if you had Wealth Simple, you could take $6, buy one share of SOT.UN, and it's going to pay you about 3.3 cents every month. Okay, I get it. Not huge, but say you build this over time and you just constantly keep putting in $6, and eventually you have $6,000 worth of SOT.UN, SOTUN, um, then that's $33 a month that you're making in rental income, which is literally what that is. Um, so if you have this in a tax-free savings account, for example, then you won't pay taxes on this income either. Um, you know, talk to an accountant for financial advice, but I don't pay taxes on that income. That's for, for sure. Um, so $60,000 in SOTUN, would net you $330 per month. Okay, not bad. Um, it's paying for a lot of uh, Netflix and restaurant trips and things like that. So say over a period of time, you really you build this up to $600,000 into, into Satun. So this would equal close to the take-home pay on a $50,000 a year salary, or in other words, $3,300 per month. So not bad, right? This is... Uh, Ultimately, at the at the end of my investment scheme, I'll probably convert to more passive income than growth. I mean, I won't really have much need for growth when I'm, you know, 60 years old. Uh, I'll be wanting that $3,300 per month or more. Um, so some other REITs that I love are SGR.UN, which is uh, Slate Grocery Stores. And so they buy grocery store properties and uh, charge them rent. And then I get some of that rent. Um, and they're trading at about $13 a share right now. And then also APR.UN, APR.UN, as I call it in my head. This is uh, automotive sales properties. So this is, uh, again, they're just renting out properties to car dealers who are paying rent to be there. And then I'm also getting a percentage of that rent. Um, so with REITs, I look for consistent yields between 6 to 8%. Um, and then I look for the kinds of properties that renters are likely to continue paying on, even if there's an economic downturn, like grocery stores, um, like houses sometimes, you know, rental, personal rental, that's, you know, up to, up to you, right? There is, there is risk in this. If they stop paying rent, then they lose the properties. And if they lose the properties, then you're not get pay, getting paid your percentage of the rent anymore. Um, so always keep in mind that uh, REIT income is dependent on the people still paying rent. Number two, dividend paying ETFs, exchange trader funds. Uh, these, are, these are bundles of different dividend paying stocks. ETFs are bundles of stocks. So if they pay dividends, then they're bundles of dividend-paying stocks, generally. And uh, so dividend-paying ETFs, some of them will pay you monthly, and I do love those. So these will typically have a lower yield than a REIT, right? Um, but they're diversified to reduce the risk. And so what I mean by that is it's a bundle of stocks. So instead of buying you know, one particular stock, you're buying quite a few. It could be TD Bank and Bank of Montreal and Scotiabank all mixed into one. So if Scotiabank starts to do bad, but TD Bank and BMO are still doing great, then you're still winning, right? So that's what I mean by diversifying to reduce risk. Because if you only had Scotiabank and it starts doing bad, uh, then you're doing bad as well. Um, 
So that's what they mean by diversifying risk with an ETF. But um, you pay for this. So there's a management fee and that's subtracted from the yield. Uh, it's usually pretty small, at least in the ones that I like. But still, you, you pay this for a manager to actively balance the bundle of stocks. So they'll reduce or eliminate the weak players and they'll boost the strong players. They'll add more percentages. They'll balance it out every so often and you pay for that. So uh, I hold two of these in a major percentage of my portfolio. I consider them um, to be the backbone of, of some of my investment accounts. So we have TSX ZDV, that's Z Delta Victor, TSX ZDV, which is a bundle of bank and energy stocks that's curated, curated by the Bank of Montreal, BMO. So these stocks were picked to grow in value over time, as well as paying a 4%-ish dividend. Um, so TSX CDV, that's, that's one of my favorites. It's just a, a steady passive income and growth in the same bundle. I mean, you really can't beat it. Um, but I also own TSX XEI, which is curated by iShares as a bundle of high-paying and consistent dividend-paying stocks. Again, typically banks and utilities and pipelines. And this one pays around 3.4% monthly. So you can see the yields aren't as high as the REITs, but there's a good chance that these will at least slowly grow over time. There's still room for these guys to grow. And then, of course, there's inflation, which causes all values to go up on, on strong companies. Okay, so next we have covered call ETFs. Now I'm counting these as a separate class of ETFs. It's still a bundle of stocks, but these stocks are special because they're using a little bit of uh, stock market magic uh, to generate even more money in dividend yields. Um, so I'm not going to go into the complexities of what a covered call is. It has to do with contracts that are, are sold at the time uh, that the shares are purchased. It's a, it's a complicated thing, but just know that it increases the yields often crazy high amounts. The trade-off with this is that there's very little expected growth because uh, the way they're making money means that they're not reinvesting into buying more stocks or growing. They're just generating income from owning these stocks. Um, so the United States has a covered called ETF called uh, Q Yield or QYLD. And this has an 11% passive income return monthly. And that's hard to beat. Um, but Canada also has a great covered call ETF in my humbled opinion, and this is TSX HUTL. Uh, this covers a group of global utility companies. So this covered call ETFs, um, TSX huddle, uh, this pays around 7.25% on a monthly basis, and it is a great hedge. So a hedge is a way of balancing risk. So uh, the ETF is a great hedge against crashing stock markets since utility companies are likely to continue making money even in the worst of economies. So I have a um, pretty considerable position in TSX uh, HUTL. Finally, and this is a relatively new one to me, so I'm not you know, recommending it or not recommending it. I mean, you choose your own pathway anyways. But I am talking about royalty companies. So these companies own branding and trademarks. They manage them. And then they collect royalty payments on them. I wouldn't expect too much growth in these. Um, I'm not sure yet, but it, I don't see the potential for it from a business or financial standpoint. But um, I would expect them to be stable and to provide a stable monthly income. Uh, so one I recently took a position in was TSX. DIV, TSX Div, based in Vancouver, and they are paying a 7% yield, and they're paying it on a monthly basis. This stock is around $2.80, which, you know, a bit of a red flag, but um, I don't have a huge position in it. it. It pays a penny per share every month. Not bad. So I, I've just bought a few shares, and I will monitor, and I will report back after a few months to see if my financial theories hold true for, for this uh, type of stock. But this is really interesting because you don't really um, hear this one mentioned too much in, in the 
thousands of hours I put into uh, researching. Good or bad Three tips on back. investing I haven't seen elsewhere. Number one, avoid confirmation bias. Confirmation bias in the context of investing is, well, researching an investment. You're looking to confirm that initial rush you got when your latest hot pick starts lining up the way you like it. So you see an article that doesn't favor your initial lineup and you might subconsciously give said article much less weight at best. Or maybe you were reading an article and you miss some overly hopeful but generally misleading statements. Uh, statements based on projections or broad theories and possibly mere hopes. Statements like, it's bounced back to 5% of pre-COVID levels and it's poised to rocket up from there. Maybe it is. Underline maybe. Do the numbers, check the general trends, the economic conditions, and the political climate. Do these line up in favor of this investment? If not, perhaps being a bit cynical can save you from a potential dud. Tip two is for a little bit more of a specific audience. This is with long-term equity investing, like, like stock trading. And if you have a smaller portfolio or a little bit less capital, or if you're paying commission fees and quite possibly even if you're not doing any of these things. So tip number two, buy the biggest chunks you can afford. And by that, I mean number of shares, assuming it makes sense, of course. Why? Number one, obvious reasons. You can dilute those commission fees. Number two, smaller gains are required to make profit. This increases your chances for said profit. Number three, this does not mean gamble on small cap stocks at large volume. Unless that's the kind of extreme risk taker you are. The more you gamble on smalls, the more you stand to lose. Tip number three, and I dare say that this tip applies to everything in life. The more homework you do, the more that you mentally invest in your investing skills, the better your odds of success will increase. Diversify your sources. Check out some American investors like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and Meet Kevin. Go a little bit outside the box. For example, I love Humble Trader, who is a day trader. The analysis and other skills that she is a master of can sometimes be adapted to my long-term investing style, to my great benefit. And learning from such polar opposites as Shay the Humble Trader and Robert Kiyosaki from Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I feel that this gives me a more complete picture. May the market force be with you. If you like this audiobook, please like, comment, and subscribe. It helps my channel tremendously, and it's all I ask in return.